Hello there, people and listeners of the Hungry Podcast. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Charlie McVeigh to the podcast. Um, Charlie is very much the man who kind of, well, one of the kind of, I'd say, founding fathers of the craft beer revolution. I mean, before there was Brewdog, before there was Camden Town Brewery, before there was Beaver Town, um, I think it was 2006, was it? I've got my research right that you you founded uh, Draft House, um, which... Charlie went on to build uh, 16 pubs, which he then successfully sold uh, to Brewdog in 2018. Um, Charlie is featured on the the program Million Pound Menu, which I actually watched, well, when that came out, back in, I think, 2019, whatever it was, uh, which is like the food and drink, kind of Dragon's Den food and drink brands. And I think one of the big heroes out of that was Black Bear Burger, which I just think is most amazing. It's an amazing burger. Um, Currently, Charlie is a, an investor. He's the investor in food stuff. Um, so Toby Sav has been on this podcast. Um, so yeah, Charlie sits as a, as the chairman for for those guys. Um, investor in Butchies Fried Chicken, Unreal Fried Chicken, and the Breakfast Club. I think that's uh, I think that's everything. <laughs> a very illustrious career. Also, Bruiser. You might not have seen the the Bruiser thing. B R E W S E R. No, what's so, that? It's a craft beer marketplace business. It's a oh, yeah. business. Really interesting business. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm on the board there and uh, it's run by some some really unbelievably, they've always sort of got PhDs, you know, they're, they're sort of hyper brainy. So what does that, what does, so what does Bruiser, when it's a craft beer marketplace? It, 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 one of the, one of the catch slogans is it's not beer 53. Uh, oh, but- <laughs> I, it's not similar to Beer 52. It, it's easy to cancel with your subscription. Um, yeah. They have relationships with the top 120 um, genuine independent craft beer breweries. And the nice thing about it is it's, 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 it's capital and process light. They're essentially a marketplace. So you, when, when, you, when you join as, as, as a subscriber, um, the, you can choose which brewery you want to send you a case of beer, uh, and then they send it to you. Bruiser does not send it to you. Whereas in, in Beer 52 and the others, they, they are buying in beer and they're distributing it. So it's a very sort of cost-heavy model. And our one is both lighter in terms of cost and, and, and fulfillment, mm. but also better because you can choose what you want to have or we can choose for you. You, know, you can mm. push the randomizer button or the, you know, this is what I like and, and you know, we'll send you a case. We'll get the breweries to send you cases you know, on a random or, or program based. So... And they've been growing like businesses have been set up with very little money. Yeah. Um, and they've been growing like crazy. I think they've now got 2,000 plus subscribers, but it's growing all the time. Uh, and I think it could, uh, like a lot of these things, it's hard to tell. Uh, but I think it could become, you know, the dominant uh, craft beer subscription business um, uh, because it's, I think, a much better model. Uh, and, and you can get much better beer. Um, through it than you can through the others. So what you, what you said there is is you said I think it could become the the dominant craft beer um, model. Obviously, you've got beer fifty three. Um, I think there's a few beer fifty two. Beer fifty two. The joke was it's not beer fifty three. <laughs> I it's not me too. <laughs> yeah. It's not. Yeah. But but no. I I do want to and we can use that as 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 uh, we can almost talk about. Uh, draft house and and then actually this this new movement with um, Bruiser. Mm. But I listened to a podcast. Um, as I said, I was in Valencia Airport. I was in Burger King. Probably sway more than I'm now. It's very hot. Uh, we're, we're recording this. Um, it's sort of boiling hot June day. Just for listeners. Um, but yeah, I was in an airport in Valencia on Friday, and I was yeah. in Burger King, and I got a Whopper burger, and. Um, was four hours and I was thinking, fuck this. Yeah. So I put, put the podcast on you did with Mark, uh, oh, the Scottish bloke. Really good conversation. He's great. He's really, really good. And he's called... Uh, Mark McClure. I can't, I'm going to butcher his surname. <laughs> it's called The Spectacular Podcast because he wears spectacles. So it was like spect- spectacle you uh, podcast. And he's called... He's going to kill me. Mark, he's Mark McClure. So it's nice... He's Scottish, very, very good. Very Scottish, very Glaswegian, uh, and very. He's an excellent interviewer. He's a very talented brand guy. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it'll come to me. His surname. You're right. It's Mook something. But he, he, like he. There was a quote that you said on that uh, podcast, and I literally almost spat my diet coke out. And I was like, mm. "Fucking hell!" Like that set my curiosity off like fireworks. Mm. 
And he basically says, he said, a business is essentially a fiction. And I think it was by um, the guy who did um, oh, oh, Sapiens. Yeah, Sapiens. Yeah, our names, the point of the heat, the names are escaping us today, but yeah. is it you, Hal Navari or something? Whatever that, but anyway. So, so I, I, you said that, and I think actually for ideas to spread and businesses to spread, there needs to be a story at the nexus of it. And there's some ideas... And I thought, okay, why did craft beer boom? Like, why did it? Because some ideas don't take off. Like, you've got, uh, so, like, obviously outside of, so it's something like Google Glasses is one that mm. just didn't take off. Mm. Um, in food and drink, uh, you know, hard seltzer, weirdly, it boots off in the States. It hasn't really got going here. Um, Meatless Farm, they just went bust yesterday. The vegan, this vegan mm. meat story. Um, and part of me thought is like, is there because the, the story isn't believable or is there something with the story? And I'd love to like sort of know is what was the fiction you created at Drive? I think, I think starting with, with craft beer per se, first of all, I'm not crazy about the term craft beer, although it is, it, it's, it's sort of a handy term. And I think it's, it's, it's ended up, uh, you know, capturing more than just what I think it started off being, um, so it started off being a sort of indie rebel you know, guys leaving their job and going, going, you know, brew beer in a bathtub and, 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 and trying to build a business and build a brand and brew incredible beer and have fun and all the rest of it. And then it's, it's ended up being sort of corporatized, I think. Uh, so I, I, I think, I think, and a lot of people, uh, you know, they see Camden Town or they see Beaver Town and, you know, great brands, great beer, but they, you know, they belong to the big guys. Mm. Um, and I think, I, th I think, I think that's, uh, that's part of the issue, but no, I think I think I think it's interesting. There are two different aspects to this. So, on the one hand, you've got you know what was craft beer all about at the beginning? Um, it was essentially about you know Screw chat, yeah, the end. Ca catching up with the trend, uh, the global trend towards um, sustainability. So, you know the, the the trend for sustainability, the trend for provenance, knowing where things come from, uh, the trend uh, for you know. Things having an independent nature rather than being part of the corporate machine, um, and I think craft. That's the, those are the kinds of things that that you know when when all those guys started in the US started making those beers. Uh, that was what really that was what really resonated with people was the fact that you know they're not you're not buying a beer that's being advertised on TV. You know you're buying it where you know a significant proportion of what you're spending on the beer is going to pay for that TV outlet. You're buying you're buying beer that's 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 really high quality. It's got incredible hops in it. It's got incredible malt in it. It's been brewed, uh, you know, on a small scale mm. uh, and, um, you know, small batch, whatever. Uh, and I think that that really resonated with people. And I think once once that once, once it got to some kind of critical scale, I think people started to switch over from, you know, Stella hmm. over to all these kids who were, who were making this incredible stuff and felt like they were part of a movement. Hmm. Um, I think there's another type of beer, which, which is, it's a, it's a slightly different story, but it's, it, but it's, but it's kind of similar and it really hasn't caught on, at least not with the younger generation, which is car scale. Uh, I, and a lot of people your age don't even really know what car scale is. Hmm. Car scale is like, you know, the original, beer which you pump mm. uh with a guy with a flat cap in the pub you know in a pipe you know <laughs> yeah drink dr drinking drinking his pint of cask and a cask is a probiotic product very healthy uh it's 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 the original english beer uh so it's got tremendous provenance uh it's it's actually a lot easier to brew in some ways than 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 cask than, than say lager uh or 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 um you know keg pale ale uh and and yet it, so it, and it has all of those kind of amazing characteristics, and yet it hasn't caught on with the young people. Young people don't get it. They haven't. They haven't. You know, the whole that whole craft beer market hasn't sort of segued into drinking cask scale. So you know, there's an example of something which which should, I think, in my head, is actually a, is actually a better story than craft beer, mm -hmm. uh, and it hasn't it hasn't caught on. Um, and uh, it, you know, maybe it will. If I'm uh, I'm I'm working with. Um, uh, beginning to work with a guy called Jamie Allsop, whose family used to own Allsop's Brewery, which was a massive brewery, you know, 1900 to probably 1960, uh, and then got sort of eaten up by one of the big breweries in, 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 the, in the 60s and sort of disappeared as a brand. And he's actually bought the, his family brand back 
mm-hmm. off of, uh, I think it's Bass or somewhere. Uh, and he's, he relaunched it a couple of years ago. We're, 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 we're planning to, in Notting Hill, we're planning to launch a, uh, a car scale pub, like a pub that really focuses on car scale and kind of tries to, in not in a boring way, but tries to educate people about why car scale is better. Uh, and it kind of, kind of also have the vibes of a, a of an old school Notting Hill pub rather than, you know, what we got now, which is not that um, um, very far from that. So, you know, it, 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 I think, I think that's the, that's the interesting thing is, is, is how, what, you know, why these things get cultural traction, you know? Yeah. I mean, I find it fascinating because it's like, why, yeah, why does, and it, you're so, uh, the, the, back to the, the business is essentially a fiction. It's like, why does a story, like, yeah, well, why does craft beer, I know you don't like that word, but just put it in sort of layman's hand. Why, why does that boot? You have to use it. Yeah. It's, it's the shorthand. No, yeah, so, so why does that boot off and then another idea doesn't boot off? Or I'm like, oh, it doesn't boot off. And I think for people listening to this who are founders who are going to want to disrupt categories, who are going to want to create a movement and, and almost sort so be the kind of the storyteller, what? Like well, one of the reasons well, why car scale has not taken off uh, is, and 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 this is, you know, is it, this this is probably, uh, yeah, this, this this is probably indicative of the challenge is that it's more complicated to manage in the pub. So it only lasts once you tap the keg. It only lasts for max seventy two hours, and then it goes off. Uh, whereas whereas keg beer lasts forever. Yeah, but that's the joy of car scale. Is it's you know when when it's gone, it's gone. You know you you you. you it's it, when it's fresh, it's delicious, then it's disgusting. Mm. It goes off, it goes off very quickly. Uh, so it's kind of like, how do we, you know, how do we educate pubs that, and how do we educate people to create demand for that so that you can get enough throughput so that you can always have great, really fresh, uh, car scale in pubs and kind of, I, I think it will happen, but it just, it just, it just takes time. But that, that's been always been one of my things. We always had a lot of car scales on. And I have to say, from time to time, we did throw away quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, we used to have a promotion in, in, in Draft House called Give Us a Stay Our Daily Cask. And basically every Monday, we would charge £2.75 for a pint of cask ale because we would have opened a lot of casks, tapped a lot of casks over the weekend. And then on Monday, we'd want to just clear it all out and mm. start again. You know? mm. So that was the, that was the vibe there. Yeah. So, uh, so, so. Back to the kind of the early days of Draft House, and obviously, won't, there's so much other stuff to explore. But I just think, in terms of this storytelling piece, mm. it's it's fascinating because I think I really believe, and Terry's kind of been a big, uh, a big purveyor of this, is that a brand is ultimately a story, and the story pulls people in, and ideas are stories. So mm. I know in that first year, uh, you you you, I think you had a pub, and it was like a, was it selling Italian food maybe, and you said yeah. that first year was all like really hard like a trough of sorrow almost it was re- desperately hard yeah. and then something happened whereby it began to gain momentum like what if we were to zoom in on that like what were the specific one or two things that changed in maybe the way you well, told just got to go back a little bit further so we had a very successful nightclub in, in in i had a very successful nightclub um i tend to say we but there were a couple of other investors um and if they're listening hi guys uh but um Called Woody's uh, in Notting Hill, and and uh, it was it's a kind of legendary '90s uh, venue, uh, sort of epicenter of bad behaviour. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the general manager, the guy who ran it for us, um, was an Italian guy, and he said to me, "I found a site, and I want to open an Italian pub." I was like, at that point, nothing had really gone wrong, uh, and so I also had the pub next door to Woody's. That was going really well. And I thought, well, anything I do, you know, being a total idiot, I thought anything I do is going to be successful. You know, what's wrong with an Italian pub? You know, uh, turns out there's a lot. <laughs> Nobody likes really. Well, nowadays actually, people like Moretti and Peroni and stuff. But in those days, you know, it wasn't really a thing. And people don't go to pubs to eat Italian food, uh, and we were unable to sort of, you know, change that habit, uh, change that perception. So. Um, we 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 had to close that pub down, uh, and we ended up uh, one one of my other uh, one of my other managers. He was it turned out was a complete beer fanatic. Uh, 
you know, in the uh, in the very early days of of what became known, this wasn't called craft beer at this stage, but there were brands like Sierra Nevada, uh, you know, and others from the US being imported into the UK in very small quantities, and 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 he had been to Canada where there was a lot of craft beer, you know, happening, and he was a sort of drinks fanatic anyway, cocktail fanatic, who was an expert on anything anything liquid, uh, and he said, look, let me have a go. So 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 we we sort of dialed the pub right back. Repainted it some traditional pub colours, you know, kind of gastro pubby kind of colours, you know, like dark reds and olive greens and you know all that stuff. I, you were too young to remember, but that was kind of what pubs looked like in the nineties. Uh, and uh, very simple menu, just like burgers, dogs, you know, whatever. It, again, you know, that wasn't really a thing back then. Um, you know, everyone was trying to do gastro pub foods; so they were trying to do high end food. I mean, yeah, we would have stayed like. You know, junk food, basically, dirty food. Uh, uh, just because it was, it was kind of, we just wanted to make it as simple as possible and do something that would work with beer uh, really well. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, 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 we put some interesting beers in the bar. We should dial back the decor. Uh, we got Adam, who was this chap, uh, the, the, the beer fanatic, hired some great people who were really, you know, yeah, interested in what we were doing, uh, and and you know before you knew it, I don't know three three four five six months in, it was really busy and it was just it was booming, uh, and it was because we were doing something different, but not that different. Yeah, it was still a pub, uh, and still sold beer, and uh, a lot of the beer was English. But it, and and meanwhile, just as we were about to open the pub, so wind back three four five six months. Uh, this guy called Duncan Sandbrook uh, walks in and says, um, "We're opening a brewery around the corner uh, behind your pub. You know, do you want to come and have? Do you want to come and have a try of the beer?" Mm. And now that's like, oh, not another fucking brewery, you know. I mean, uh, you know, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. then, yeah, yeah. This is like, uh, I remember when that was. I think it was probably like 2007 or eight. Then it was like. Wow, someone's opening a brewery. That's seriously cool, you know. Mm. Epic. You mm. know, we was we were so excited. So we all sort of ran around to you know, drank lots of pints of Duncan's beer and uh, and uh had a fabulous time with Duncan, realized that Duncan was a top bloke. Uh and uh and then so we sold his beer for many, many years as a what that was a car scale. One of our car scales. Uh Duncan, uh it's called Wandle after the river, Sandbrook's Wandle. Uh and uh so all those things were they all sort of came together and 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 people just started to build a real loyalty to the to the pub and the people mm-hmm. who worked there. They, it wasn't boring in the sense you didn't go there, you know, for a really like refined experience of drinking beer. Uh hopefully uh you know, the, the staff, the team weren't being boring about beer. They're just having fun and but just going, You should try this, it's amazing. Uh and you know, when something new came in or whatever. And that just wasn't something that ever happened in the pub. You know, pubs, you just went in and there was like Stella, Carling, you know, Guinness, um, and that was it, you know. Uh, and so, that, so this was just something completely different, but it also felt kind of the same. It just felt like this is the natural progression of how a pub should evolve. Uh, and that became the, that was called the Westbridge Public House in Darling Rooms. And that, I know you're, you're dying to jump in, but that became, the, that was the Westbridge Public House in Darling Rooms. Uh, and uh, that was the, that was basically the, the, the seed the germ uh, of of Draft House. And then the next one we opened was on that was on Battersea Bridge Road. And down the road we opened another pub on 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 Northcote Road in, in Battersea, South Battersea, uh in uh, Nappy Valley as they call it. Uh that 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 was the first draft house. Mm. Um I've got one more story to tell on that. So 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 the draft house itself, the name, came because our second pub was supposed to be uh, in Westfield, uh, in in Shepherd's Bush, when they launched Westfield in two thousand and nine, we were we were supposed to be their pub mm. uh, because the woman who was doing the curation of the sort of food retail offer in in, in Westfield was a regular in in Westbridge in in our you know in our cool little craft beer pub, uh, and so it was a massive site, and we got very excited. We raised the money. Uh, did all society. It was going to cost us like seven hundred fifty grand to do. It was a hell of a lot. It was just really squeaky bum time, terrifying project. And this was sort of end of two thousand and eight. 
Uh, and then we didn't quite get the lease over the line and signed by the end of 2008. And then 2009, again, you're probably too young, but it was, a, it was, a, it was just the end of the world financially. It was like the financial crisis blew up in January and all of our investors ran away. So we ended up not doing that pub, but we had decided because we thought in Westfield, uh, there'll be lots of, you know, wives uh, dragging their sort of slightly disconsolate husbands around, uh, around. <laughs> River yeah, and, yeah. and they'd be like, look, here I go west, you know, where, where, how can I, how can I get out of this living hand? You know? <laughs> We we wanted a we wanted a we wanted to have a name that that, that was you know a Ron Seal type name that would do in a set of the ten and that became the draft house. Uh, and although we didn't end up doing that site, thank God actually, as it turned out. Although in fact, I think if we had done it, it would have been hugely successful. Because yeah, long story, but but that that I sent up site that was one of my main mistakes in business. But um, we ended up uh, applying that name to the site in Austin Road, and that was the beginning of the brand. For people listening, in terms of creating that story, what what you've said there, there's there's a lot in it, and I think the first thing is you, you don't just sit down and create the story and then away you go. It's like you've got to take a lot of action first, mess around, not mess around, but try a lot of stuff, throw a lot of stuff at the wall, see what sticks, and then the story will come out of that. And I sat with a guy called um, called Alex Smith. He's like a brand strategy guy. And he basically said that. He said, it's like the first couple of years is a lot of serendipity. It's trying different stuff. It's mm-hmm. trying the Italian food, realizing that doesn't work, reversing back. And then you, and then you eventually find your way. So I think that's really reassuring for listeners. But then also the way the movement started is, or for at least for you guys, what I'm picking up is you just injected that fun sort of storytelling bits at, at the point of purchase. Mm-hmm. And there's a brand, um, there was a, there's a brand, I don't know if you've heard of them, called Perfect Ted. So yeah. but ev- basically everyone said matcha is too niche, waste of time. It's, it's a matcha drink. They've got them in Tesla's, I'll say that. Mm. Waste of time, don't bother, blah, 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 blah. They basically, matcha was quite a serious, they're the green powder. Yeah, I know, mate. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They've come in and made it fun, injected storytelling, mm. and then and now like it's, they've got investment from Stephen Bartlett, they've just unlocked a shitload of listings all through just taking something that was not ser- necessarily serious, but quite like um, almost a bit like placid and then just injecting fun to it. And I think there's a lot in that. Even like cause your, your chicken rules, everything, everything around me t-shirt is like a Wu-Tang Clan reference. Yep. You know, yeah, like that's just a, even that storytelling, do you know what I mean? But there's these little moments of it. How did you, you, you said you spoke to... Um, Someone called is it Fruit Fruit my Fruit 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 sorry Fruit um, Fruit Carl yeah so uh, who who did our brand yeah because that you talked to what well, I again do research you said we had to codify the brand and I think you could have a unreal business and you could have an unreal product but if you don't create a brand it's like having a Ferrari with no engine do you know what I mean it's all going to get going yeah but I, th- I, th- I think I think what we did and I think what Butchers has done. Uh, which is a my fried chicken brand, uh, which um, founded by not my brand, but I'm an investor and it founded by Garrett Fitzgerald. Is you know there was a lot of trial and error uh, and a lot of blind alleys and a lot of um, you know a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I think both brands have had the luxury of being profitable early but not necessarily needing to codify the brand, formulate the brand at an early stage, just started off doing something that was profitable. Yes, we made mistakes. Yes, things went wrong. Yes, you know, just, you know, running a business is just one, it's just one, you know, catastrophe after another, you know, but, 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 but actually in the end, uh, these were profitable businesses underlying. Uh, so as a result, we had the time to actually create something that functioned and that worked and that clearly customers liked, despite the mistakes, despite everything else. Uh, we had sales that were growing. We had profits that were growing. And so if you have that, then, you know, you think, well, actually there is something here and maybe we're going to do another one. In our case, it was Norska Road. Uh, in Garrett's case, it was Running a spectacularly profitable and successful street food stall uh, on on Broadway Market, 
uh, and then deciding to go into bricks and mortar. But he sort of perfected the product, perfected the early iteration of the brand, which was completely homemade. Uh, just in his stall, and it, it became quite famous, wow. uh, Butchies. Wow. Uh, uh, and uh, as a result, um, you know, when you then sit with someone like Frith Carr from Studio Frith, who, K-E-R-R, uh, it's her surname, F-R-I-T-H, um, who's a genius. But, but you know, you, and we also worked with, 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 with a couple of other people earlier on, but, but you you have something to codify, you know. It's so I think what 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 I what seems to me to happen quite a lot at the moment is people say, right, we're gonna we're gonna set up a you know, we're gonna start, I don't know, brand making bricks, you know, but we're gonna make this incredible <laughs> we're gonna make this incredible brand, you know, around bricks. And we're gonna start with the brand. Uh and then we're gonna kind of the the actual business is gonna follow on from the brand. We're gonna invest a lot of money in the brand, we're gonna invest a lot of money in social media, and marketing and so on. Uh the product is going to kind of follow on afterwards and hopefully we'll make money. But we know that initially we're going to lose a lot of money because because that's the nature of that kind of business. Um, and uh, I think I think that's what I, I my, instinctively my philosophy of business or whatever you want to call it, you know, my MO in business is to try and make money uh, early on, mm-hmm. uh, try and start off being profitable and then grow from there. I don't really, I, I get, I get, Restless and 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 unsettled uh, around loss leading loss leading businesses, uh, and uh, so yeah, that. So that. it was almost what is so reassuring for 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 me, and just such a truism is it's almost like the story uh, back to the story piece is the story follows the business, mm. and I think a lot of people, probably myself as well, would think right, I'll just create a banging brand story on Canva mm. and away we go, then the business will follow. And I think um, I think it, it goes back to like having a great product as the, in food and drinks. I see this happens with every single guest who's elevated or made, done really, really well. They've all said product first, focus on the product mm. and all the other bells and whistles you can focus on next. Mm. Whereas I think it's quite... It's very romantic to start a food and drink brand or or a food business, but but I think you can get pulled into the into the grim weeds of not making money. <laughs> and the, the biggest example of that is all this meat stuff, this vegan meat, where it's, yeah. it's like you know, and it's it, is is that a boom or bust? Is there have people? Well, I've, I've been bullish with that. Do you know what I mean? I think I was reading an article today about about um, Frank and Beach. And uh, we're saying that actually the, the, the process is always going to be lab-based and very expensive to make it. It's always going to be very hard to make money out of it. This, it, it it's, 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 not, it's, it's difficult, apparently. It's difficult to make it at scale uh, because um, the, I think it's because, and I didn't fully understand the article but, because it was quite technical, but I think, the, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the idea was that the process of creating a, a culture which then grows into me, that kind of like that's the Franken element, right? Mm, you know, mm. The Frankenstein element of this thing is is can generate can can readily generate poisons, mm-hmm. things that uh, things that can can be um, harmful. So they were saying, for example, that there's one there's one uh, enzyme that's created in in in, in the Franken meat process, in that kind of culture culture meat process, which. Which can re- which, which can render women infertile, you know, as an example. Uh, and so they have to make sure that you know that because it's, it's different from slaughtering a cow, chopping it up, and selling it. You know, uh, obviously also not you know ideal from the cow's point of view, but but you know it's quite a straightforward process. Uh, and this is like highly highly complex. So I think getting I think getting that to the point of real scale and profitability is 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 more difficult than 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 it would appear. Uh, um, and uh, that's a bit of a that's a bit, that's a bit of an aside, but you did you did mention no, no, but I think I think that's right, and I think they're coming up with uh, coming up with a great product. I mean, in the case of retail, it's which is what Draft House was. You know, it's a pub, essentially a retailer. It's coming up with um, you know a tremendous experience for the customer, um, and then building a brand around that. It's great, but of course, you obviously start off at the brand. I mean, mm. you have to. It's got to be called something. Mm. You know, hungry is called hungry. I mean. Hungry is not is not Stephen Bartlett yet. 
Yeah. Uh, it's not the, what is it called? The something CEO? Diary of a CEO. Diary of a CEO, yeah. I mean, it's not Diary of a CEO. Maybe it will be one day, but it has to be called something. And that brand has to have a significance, has to have a meaning. Uh, so it's not just, you know, you can't call it, call it the wine label, or maybe you could, but the wine label uh, podcast, uh, just the podcast. Mm, I mean, mm. it's actually quite a good name, but but probably wouldn't take, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, given how many there are. Um, but so yeah, I think I think I think that you know, I guess what I really mean is you've got to be you've got to build something that's profitable, and then you've got to be very open to how you evolve the brand and then codify the brand as you go along. Mm. Uh, and of course, any brand, and I think this is why so many restaurant businesses get into trouble as they get to scale in the UK. Any brand needs to be reinvented all the time, needs to be moved forward, needs investment. I mean, that's Perry's business. We. When we talk about Perry, we're talking about Perry Hayden Taylor from Big Fish. He's been on this podcast three times extraordinarily. <laughs> this is my first time. Uh, may there be many more. Uh, but uh, and I, I think that constant reinvention, you know, preserving the 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 essence, the ethos of the brand, but moving it forward all the time, uh, in line with culture, the, the wider culture, in line with the product as the product evolves, and like you know, uh, and of course, you know. Evolving is a risk. Uh, yes, it's it's much easier just to stay as you are, and it's a lot cheaper, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but ultimately, you have to. Yeah, and what, one of the things that kills businesses is is just going right. We've perfected it now. Let's just let's just keep spending the same amount of money on marketing, the same money, and the business will keep growing. Uh, and oh, and let's cut the costs while while we're at it. And then before you know it, you're catching a falling knife and, and the whole thing is going bust on you, you know. So it's 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 challenging, you know. What's what's mental is that Mark interview was in twenty eighteen. Yeah. Five years ago. And I was thinking and there was some stuff in there that you were talking about Albert Schloss in Manchester. I went to uni up in Manchester. Yeah. Um I can never say old and old Shington market, whatever it is. Oldchim, yeah. yeah, so that's now like become more of a thing. So it's, well, what was you said something which is uh, AI is coming down the road, mm. which is mad. And it's like we'll, we'll talk about profit is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what I, I want to talk about that later. But, but what what I'm what I'm, what I'm basically <laughs> saying is is it's so true. Like when I listened to the to the podcast you with Mark five years ago, you're like, oh my god, like the landscape now is so different. And I think we're like the food, um, almost the concept of uh, street food was was just beginning to sort of bubble in the zeitgeist. Whereas now it's like everywhere. Yeah. Um, so and I think if we, it went by having that this interview today and the conversation you had with Mark is like if you don't constantly reinvent. You just become stale and pallid and just mm. be, sort of just go and evaporate into the ether. Mm. Going into that, like, how do people reinvent without losing their core essence and their soul? Because I think I've seen it happen before firsthand where you try and reinvent yourself and you're like, it just, it's, yeah. it's like putting on the wrong clothes. I think, I think, I think that the, the, the key thing is to be, to dance you know, like nobody's watching, right? So the whole point about business and brand is, you know, you've got to be just, you, you can't be what you, know, there's got to be a part of you. There's got to be a part of your headspace and as a business and as an individual, if you're the CEO or the founder or whatever, which just loves doing what you're doing and is having fun and is always thinking forward. And, you know, just because you've, you know, you've had a, absolutely fucking terrible last three months and you know sales have gone down and you're losing money and somebody key in the business has left and you know and, and there's all these terrible things are happening which is basically you know welcome to welcome to running your own business you know uh you 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 have to you have to be able to carve out that that headspace which says um you know i am so excited about how you know coca-cola is going to evolve uh, this year mm. uh, and uh, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it can sometimes be sometimes a really great uh, marketing and brand evolution can happen by mistake. You know, uh, for example, like like when KFC ran out of chicken, you know, hmm. and they created one of the it was one of the you know out of the recovery of that, which you know the, remember the F asterisk CK uh, campaign, you know, which was basically fuck, we've run out of chicken. You know. <laughs> Sorry, guys, you know, but we're going to be back. Uh, and it, it, they did it with so much wit and joy and, 
and excitement and uh you know uh, and, and 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 humility uh importantly um that you know when they did get chicken back they, their sales were up enormously i mean like vastly up because they just they just caught and that's a big company. I mean, Yum Brands is one of the biggest restaurant businesses mm-hmm. in the world, yeah. if not the biggest. Uh, and uh, and they were nimble enough to when they had a problem in the, the you know tiny little UK market, uh, they 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 absolutely nailed it. And they they the, the, their UK business was not in trouble before; it was fine, it wasn't amazing. It's amazing now, mm. and that's because of what they did with that recovery. So that that can happen. Or and and in a way, that's that's a gift. Is there an example of how you did that at Woody's or or the Draft House with this? Because I think what's joyful to hear is is as you said, like business is hard. There's loads of failures. It's you know every day this is going to mess up, fuck up kind of thing. But to, mm. to create a space in your mind to have that sort of frivolous kind of fun and as you say, dance like no one's watching. Is there an example of how you reinvented without um, losing your? Well, you have to constantly you, you you have to constantly say what is the right thing to do here for the brand, for the business, for the team, for the customer. It's and and it's yes, you want to what yes, any you know any business person has to control costs, but it's not it's not generally in anyone's interest to 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 slash costs in a business because you're in trouble. You know, generally speaking. And it's also probably not anyone's just to double down hugely and spend loads more money. You've just got to be clever about how you how you plan out. Like, okay, we're in the shit at the moment. What do we need to do for the next six to twelve months, next two years? I mean, we're just in the middle of a of, of an exercise at, at, at Butchie's, where which is called 20, 2025. and what that means is twenty sites by twenty twenty five, uh, and that's a two that's a two part exercise. Part one is what do we do for the next three months? And part two is what do we do for the next three years? And they're, they're completely different exercises. You know, the, the next three months is like, what are the things we need to do to build the foundations, you know, with the brand, with the product, with the team, uh, so that we, at the end of those three months, we, 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 we have the platform to go and do the three year thing, which is the 20 sites. We're at six at the moment. Uh, and, uh, and then. You know, you get to the end of that three months, and another three months plan. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and so it's, it's 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 what are we doing tomorrow, and what are we doing in five years' time? You know, and both those things are equally important. You know, uh, and if you if if you get either of them wrong, uh, you you will you will fail, definitely fail, uh, and and that's why this whole dance dance like nobody's watching. That's the five year. That's like we we need to do the right thing now. Mm-hmm. We need to do the right thing. You know, consistently, and we need to we need to think of you know we need to operate within the parameters of our brand. You know, what are the things that make uh, that make this business special? Mm. So, in the case of Butchies, uh, for example, uh, you know, it's 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 you know what one of our brand things is one of our brand principles is is make money every day, but we also have help and homelessness. You know. Uh, and uh, and we have still got love for the streets, actually, which is help and homelessness. Uh, and how do we make those two things work together for the next five years so that when we get uh, to the end of the three months, the next three months, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? So that so then hopefully we smash that. We get a twenty size in two years. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, doesn't always happen, and most businesses fail. You know, and you have to accept that. It's. Um- um, one thing I heard you say, I think it was the guy from Piper, Crispin, and mm. is that seven, seventeen, and seventy, which yeah. is the almost the hurdles, the roadmap, yeah, the roadmap as you scale. And one thing, and I could be wrong, and that's why I love doing these podcasts, is you get a kind of really, you know, test and tweak ideas. But one thing I believe is that sometimes scale can kill magic, mm. and it can kill like. You, you know, the, the thing on your T-shirt, so cream, chicken rolls, everything around me. Like, that's such a beautiful, like, little mm. bit of mm. wordplay. It's obviously on brand with Butchie's, starting East London, like, you know, Wu-Tang Clan. Like, that's that's amazing, but it's such a beautiful little thing. Sometimes as brands scale, and this is what I've learned from, you know, speaking to William Chase, he was like, as soon as you get bigger, sometimes corporate people can come in and it just kind of eviscerates the culture. 
you seem to have done that. You managed to bring, bring people in who were from, I think, Weatherspoons and stuff like that and managed to get that part right. Yeah. Talk, it, talk to me about that. Well, that's, that's right. And I think that in the end, you know, delivering the brand through operations. I mean, if you're a retailer, yeah. delivering the brand through operations uh, requires systems. It requires being systematic. It requires having really brilliant people who are great at managing the team, recruiting, incentivizing, motivating, you know, uh, monitoring, you know, the team. Because when you get to 20 sites or whatever, you know, Charlie, bless him, you know, can't, can't be everywhere. You know, I can't run around going, you know, what's going on in Milton Keynes, what's going on in Manchester, what's going on in, 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 in East London, West London, whatever, you know. You, you, so you need systems. And to, to accept, you have to accept that. But then it's it's what are the rules of those systems, you know, and I'll, and and do those rules adhere to the fundamental principles of the brand? And if they do, and you can deliver that, happy days. And if they don't, either it's better, in which case, great, we've learned something, and let's adjust the principles. And you know, believe me, people adjust that. You know, principles are not set in stone, uh, or. Fucking hell! No, we're not doing that. Like, we're not we're not going to start selling Stella because it's cheaper, you know, because that would be an idiotic thing to do, just because it would help us to get to scale and 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 AB InBev, which makes Stella is going to give us a million quid because you know, so the draft house will sell will sell Stella, uh, you know that even though that might make sense to the FD, you know, it, it's it's certainly not going to make sense to the customer or the team. Most importantly, the team would be like they'd all quit if you started selling Stella, you know. So so I think. I think it's like systems are really important. I think getting great people in, like Richard Peachman, who's the guy you're talking about, yeah. can be hard out of out of Weatherspoons to kind of systematize the business. But the whole point of that was to create a system which allowed us to replicate, uh, you know, the original draft house in lots of locations, so that lots of lots more people could have the wonderful experience that we gave people in 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 Westbridge in the first one, uh, and. But, you know, there are lots of businesses that fail on that. And I'm not saying that we were successful all the time. I mean, you know, either we were, at times we got too prescriptive and too, like, system-y. Uh, and at other times we let it go too much and, you know, certain pubs would be dirty or, or you know, like everyone was having too good a time yeah. uh, drinking on the job or whatever. And it was a bit chaotic, you know, and the customer would walk in and go, actually, you know what, I don't really want to be here. The mm. 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 So, and, and, and so... You know, retail discipline, which is fundamentally what we're talking about, um, is it doesn't matter whether you're the coolest brand in the world. If you're the coolest brand in the world. You need retail discipline even more because otherwise people are just going to poke holes and they're going to walk in and go, yeah, there's no, there's no real trouser here. You know, it's all mouth. Uh, I and, think, and, and I think that's key. Yeah. I think what's, yeah, what you're saying is fascinating because as I say, some of the guests who I've had on who are the founders, there's always going to be this moment where, the founder is often brand, I think, well, predominantly, not always, but a lot of the time the founder is the brand. I think a brand is often an extension of the founder. They hit this point of scale where they need more systems coming in, in place. And what happens is, is the person comes in, tries to like disrupt, and I'm seeing this happen firsthand, disrupt the status quo. And you basically get like a, a, a thing where the, the brand doesn't lie up and lie in, align with the systems. Ben Branson from Seedlip said he, he, it happened three times with three hires or it just, it just went wrong. Yeah. Will Chase said the same thing from Tyrrells. What were you with, with um, uh, Richard Peachman? Mm. Yeah, Richard Peachman. What, like, what did you ask him in the interview? Or like, how did you ensure that he, he came in to deliver the systems, but was also going to uh, deliver the brand, as you say? Because that's, I think that's a real hurdle for people listening. Well, I, think he was, I think he was in love with the brand anyway. He right, was a fan. Right, okay. Uh, and I think he was desperate to leave Weatherspoons because it, 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 Weatherspoons is, is such a, a, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant business. I'm a massive Tim Martin fan, but it's a very, very rigid and, and, and a company culture because they're in a thousand sites or whatever, and that's the way it has to be, right? And I think he wanted to get into a more entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial environment. He's somebody that places a, a, a premium on cool, uh, which I actually don't, but he did. And so he wanted to work somewhere cool. And that was really important to him. It, mm. it is, I was like, for cool. I mean, I don't really know what cool <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and I think he would recognize that if he, if, if he was listening. Um, 
but I think he uh, ultimately, and then he, and then he kind of started. And he was like, actually, this is all a bit shit. Yeah, you know? like you know, just to use a Perry phrase. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these guys really have no idea what they're doing, uh, and it's completely inconsistent. Uh, and you know, one pub's doing it this way, one manager's doing it that way. You know, and and from the customer point of view, there's no consistency. Mm. Uh, even from you know one manager to the next on shift, you know, uh, and that, yes, people are having a good time, but but not always because if you don't have rigid, you know, rigorous systems, and some people, you know, you can you can end up with HR issues, you can end up with all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, and it's fine if you've only got one or two pubs or three pubs and you, you can be there all the time. Um, but it, if you can't be, be there all the time, you need those systems. And Richard was brilliant at that. Uh, but we, you know, we made some mistakes on recruitment along the way. And I think, I think it is something where quite often, if you're, if you're the, if you're the founder, you know, the entrepreneur, uh, you always have, um, every founder both has some, some kind of blend of Messiah syndrome, but also, um, uh, imposter syndrome, right? Oh yeah. Well, so, yeah. so, so, and, it, and like the dial is moving all the time between Messiah, like I know all the fucking answers and how dare anyone challenge me. Uh, and then the other one is imposter syndrome. I don't really know what I'm doing. I haven't done this before. You know, I'm really worried because we're running out of money. Uh, and it's just a shit show, the whole thing. And it's, and what am I going to do? And I don't really know how to ask, you know, the question. And when you're, when you're in the, that, that side of the dial, um, you know, it, you, you, you can hire people because you think, oh, well, they've done, you know, this guy has been the operations director of, of, of Weather Spirits, right? Or, you know, Mitchelson Butler, uh, another huge pub co. Uh, and so he must know what he's doing, right? He has to. You know, he's done it before, and I don't know what I'm doing because I'm just making it up, right? Uh, and then the guy comes in, and, and 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 you know, he 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 try to your point, he kind of wrecks it because he tries to make re remake it in his own way. And you're kind of like standing off. You're going, I'm just going to let this guy run it. And obviously, yeah. I, I everything I've done is shit, and everything he's going to do is brilliant. Uh, and of course, he understands the brand and everything else. Of course, he gets the team. Uh, and then it's all horrible, and you end up firing him, uh, oh. and, and and you you, you get into a huge, you know, huge like, you know, just massive clusterfuck, uh, and then you have to somehow get out of that situation, get some of the people back who've left, you know, that kind of pull it all back together again, uh, if you can, or maybe you go bust, you know, and at that point. So I think that is that 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 you know, whereas Richard. Instinct, but first of all, he's humble. So he, so as a person, uh, so he listened. Uh, I think he realized quite quickly a lot of what I was saying was shit, but, but, you know, he still listened. And then he, he was very respectful of the brand. Uh, and, uh, and, but together, you know, the, the, the two of us, uh, and then later RFD, you know, we did, we did make it a better business, you know, through systematizing it, but also through being respectful. The brands are evolving things over time, not wrecking the whole thing on day one, not trying to completely change everything day one. So yeah, I think it was. I think you could go, you know, but, but hiring the right person, and there there is always go, probably always going to be an element of luck in that, mm. because you know a lot of people are very impressive in interview, and they might have great references, but they may not actually just be the right guy. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you need there's 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 like you need the right guy for every role if you're going to be successful. Mm. It's scary how much you need that. You can't have people who are a bit shit or not quite right. Uh, and then and then you have that the, the the other dial on that is okay. So left side of the dial is I give them a chance and see see how they do. Maybe maybe they can they can get a bit better. Right side of the dial is fucking fire him right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a rough dial, that one, because you don't know. And the longer they're there, that person who's not quite right, the more everyone who works with them is like getting pissed off. Uh, yeah. And if they're not improving, it's like- It's cancer. And then you just think, yeah. why didn't I do that? You know, but you don't know, some people turn around. So it's difficult and making those decisions is difficult. What you said about the, the, the pendulum swinging, and I think, it, you've hit this. You've so hit the nail on the head, Charlie, with the, with this Messiah versus um, 
first imposter, imposter syndrome. I mean, I feel like I feel like that pretty much every day. Yeah. Whereas women, I'm like, I know exactly what I fucking do. And the next room, yeah. I'm like, what am I doing? And I was like, <laughs> um, and so, so, but I think I, I think brands start and there's a huge, healthy, big dosage of naivety. And I really believe brands are a bit like. Um, I see the brand progression as like a, as a as a journey of almost like a, a toddler growing up. So as a, as a toddler, you're super curious. You walk around, try stuff, da, 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 da. and then as you get older, i.e., scale, you almost become like that insecure, insecure thirty year old at the school disco, i.e., the imposter syndrome, the hot licks of imposter syndrome come piling in, mm. and you're like, "Fucking hell!" Like someone else, like someone tell me what to do, like tell me what to dress, like tell me what to. And I've seen that happen. And then the, as you say, and this is what, as you say, the pendulum swings because it's one minute the founder's like, right, this person's coming in from wherever and they're going to set a place on fire. We'll listen to them. And then, but then, then they've got to defend the team of, of the old guard, i.e., and be the messiah a bit. And it's, you get this, as you say, cluster, cluster fire truck, whatever we said. And um, I think what's, what, what you said, I'm, I'm really trying to get into the nuance of so many people listening to this, we're trying to, we'll be going on that journey. Yes. And as you say, if you don't get the right person in the right role, then it could go bust. So, so with with um, Richard, you, you said he was super humble, so that's a good thing to look for. He listened. Tough as nails. I mean, I, 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 Richard, Richard's like, ears will be burning. Uh, I'll, I'll have to tell him that, that he's being mentioned, uh, and we'll see what he thinks about it. But he, but he, he's a tough guy, but he was humble, you know, uh, in the sense that he listened. Um. And, uh, and, you know, together, you know, we made, we made that, we made, we, we, we made the business what it was. Um, what was your Messiah slash imposter syndrome? Like, how did you navigate that as the founder? Um, I, well, I definitely thought, and I, and I only really realized this quite a long time after I sold the business. I definitely thought that I was the only person who could run the business. Right. I thought there was something special about me, you know, in terms of, I don't know, tone of voice and on, on copy. I, mean, I wrote all the copy, for yeah, example, to yeah. the business. And I thought that I only I had the right tone of voice and the copy and no one else could do it. Whenever anyone else did it, it was shit. Uh, and, you know, that I was, even though, you know, I've been talking about, you know, how you delegate and how you, how you create systems to allow the business to grow, I was still in everything. So there was no decision that I wasn't it, mm. you know, I mean, that's 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 of course a huge exaggeration. I mean, I wasn't ordering every pound to be a supplier, but yeah. but any 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 decision, particularly one that I thought was a fun decision, like we had to get involved, and even if it was someone else's job to make the decision, it was like, yeah, I'll deal, I'll deal with this. You know, this is really this is going to be really cool. You know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get involved here and just throw my weight around. You know, uh, and uh, I mean, there's a there's a great uh, uh, I was I was, I was talking. A friend of mine runs a coaching business. Uh, she she. She has uh, like twenty, making a something. She's got twenty five coaches, and so she really, she really knows about all this stuff. Uh, she said, um, what, what are, "One of the one of the questions you need to ask a founder of a business is, um, is uh, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king?" Uh, and uh, the, the when you when you work with someone, it's interesting. I mean, not, obviously, once again, you know, talking about the dial or the pendulum, no, nobody's exclusively one or the other. But but um, you know, King is someone who has a court. Uh, you know, everyone's around them is is looking up to them. They make all the decisions. It's top down. It's like Putin's mm-hmm. Putin's army. You know, ultimately, you know, there's no decision making going on on the ground. Um, it's all being made. It's all top down. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and so delegation. Uh, and uh, and there's also a, a big ego thing going on, right? Uh, whereas rich is how do we make this business incredibly uh, efficient and scalable so that it can grow uh, and I can make lots of money and every decision I make is going to be about how do I make more money mm. out of this business. Uh, of course, that can also kill the business. Because if you're if you're forgetting to the earlier to the earlier conversation, if you're forgetting about you know the soul of the business, which you know, the brand or whatever, if if you if you make too many sacrifices on that front, um, you, know, you lose it. So I think I think these are all these are all interesting things to think about when you're either you're thinking about investing in a business or helping a business in some way, 
or running a business? You know, what am I? What 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 are my instincts? And and if I was to go under a bus tomorrow, what would happen? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and uh, that that is that's it's a good question to ask yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, I've been thinking about it. And it's like, I've almost thought with this is I kind of, because I've seen, uh, and it, like, I think one of the things I definitely believe is you're nothing set. So you can, right now, for the next couple of years, I want to have it, keep this kind of super small and make money. Like, that's the goal, mm. 100%. But eventually, I'm, I may do a brand. But it's asking yourself the questions, the hard questions. And it's like, do, are, you, are, you, are you doing this? Are you, are you, do you want to be the king because people on LinkedIn are posting about they're the fucking king? Do you know what I mean? And you, there's a lot of all that stuff to deal with now. And I wrote about this in my news. I was like, do you actually want to build, to scale a business and build a huge business? Or, or do you want to build an amazing brand that makes people happy and you take hundred grand a year? Like that, there's, they're two very different things. I think people want to be, get pulled into this king thinking, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting. Well, I think thing. there's also the, the, there's also the idea of a lifestyle business, uh, yeah. which is related to that. It's not quite the same thing, but a lifestyle business is one where you enjoy yourself every day when you wake up. It's fun. Everyone thinks you're cool, you know, uh, and uh, you don't actually make very much money, but you make enough to live. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that ultimately is never going to be a scalable business. Um, mm. But it's it's also not, you know, you might be the, I mean, there's no right or wrong. You know, yeah, yeah. The kind of person, for not you, but one might be the kind of person for whom running a lifestyle business is great, you know. So that's, for example, if it, you know, if if, Goes you, back. if you run a shop and it's a really successful shop uh, and everyone likes going there, it's an independent shop and it's famous for being independent or independent restaurant, for example, you know, that that's great. I mean, you can make a lot of money out of a really successful independent restaurant, yeah. But not you're never going to make millions, you know. You make you might make a hundred thousand a year, two hundred thousand a year, but you're not going to make millions. And 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 ultimately. The, the drive to to make a lot of money is 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 what drives the need to scale. And of course, you know your background in, is in peanut butter, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dan, uh, and my background is in retail, right, in pubs. And they're two very different things: scaling a product, getting it into getting into the supermarket, and building that that network of retailers who are going to stock it is a very different beast. Um, beast. And these sort of things you need to invest in and the things you need to be good at, you know, sales, distribution, et cetera, are very different from uh, the things you need to be good at to open pub after pub after pub after pub and have them all be successful. Uh, and, you know, it's just a different, it's, 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 it's a very different thing. I mean, br- very broadly speaking, you know, if, 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 you, if you create a peanut butter brand, you want it to be a big peanut butter brand, and you want to, if if you if you're a rich guy, you know, you want it to be in in in, in thousands of shops, so you can sell it to Unilever for for a billion, right? Mm. Uh, and likewise, if you're a pub guy, you at least want to be able to show that, you know, at various key milestones, you want to be able to show that the business is 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 profitable in it. Okay, it's at thirty sites now, but we've got another 70 locations where we think this is definitely going to work based on the evidence of what we've created so far. Uh, and, you know, so Mr. Mr. Brewdog or Mr. Whoever, Mr. Weatherspoon's, why don't you buy my business? Because it's a hundred site business and you can, you know, currently it's valued at 30 sites. You know, you can, you can, you can have the rest, you know, right. uh, and therefore you're going to pay a premium for, for, for all that business because we've got a system, we've got a brand, we've got a customer base, we've got, social media following, you've got all these things, you know, uh, and, and I think that is, yeah, they, they are very different. I think, I think, and I, and I don't understand I mean, I've got involved a little bit in some businesses, which are product driven, you know, like peanut butter driven, hmm. uh, get it. Don't this, understand it. The, but also I think to your point is you can change, you can reinvent yourself. So, so, um, a business called Love Raw, uh, they do like the, it's basically a vegan kind of bueno, it's, Genius business, got loads of distribution. Start out, he was in, um, Manav was in Marbella, lifestyle business, selling this with his wife. Mm. Did that for four or five years, could make good dough out of it. But then they thought, right, comes to the UK, they've got investment from Julie, Julie, uh, Jules, um, who's a co founder of Grenade, you know, mm. Grenade bars or protein bars, I should say. Um, 
and now, and now they've got a full blown team. They've codified the business. I think you can change. And I think I think what I'm trying to get to this, people listening to this, is it's about asking yourself the questions and having self awareness. One, yeah, because I, I read somewhere that Lou Johnson, who was the guy at Pizza Express, wasn't he? I think guy, the guy who bought Pizza Express when they had very few sites, and with David Page, they turned it into a huge business. Yeah. So I read somewhere he said he once gave you a book, The Moon Underwater, in search of the perfect pub. Basically said there's no definitive pub. It's all about their eccentricities. Right. I love that. I'd love to know like, what are just some of your favourite pubs. Like, I mean, I love a pub. Like, I think William Blake's got a quote that um, a pub is basically a church with warmer conversation and warmer people. <laughs> William Blake, I don't find that hard to believe, but yeah, it's... it's it, I don't think it's a church. I mean, I, I think I think what the the essence of a great pub, uh, and I, I I'd like to think we did achieve this from time to time at, at the Draft House, but I I think it's it's a place where when you go in, um, the molecules kind of slow down a bit. There's something called entropy, which is where it's a sort of sealed environment, and 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 gradually the 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 molecular structure just kind of kind of slows down, uh, and I think I think that is the thing. It's a sort of depressurizing uh, experience going mm-hmm. to the pub. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and at its best, you, know, you walk in, sit down, order a beer, have a chat. You know, maybe there's someone at the bar being stupid. You know, and you have a chat with them. Maybe there's some hot girl walks in. You know, whatever it is. You know, and uh, I think it's just it's an environment where random things should happen and random conversation. Uh, and where you should feel, you know, at home, uh, happy, uh, and uh, and as I say, relaxed. And and it's a relaxing uh, process at its best, and not really anything to do with. I mean, it's it's an advantage uh, to have great beer. It's an advantage to have great food, and all those things. But I think that that is what makes. Uh, a pub great and i and i do think it's you know they, there's this whole narrative around um you know is is the gen z equivalent of the pub the coffee shop mm. uh and i kind of it's it's a clever line uh and i get it particularly when we also read uh that you know 40 percent of of gen z doesn't drink and and, and therefore you know uh the the pub is not ready for that, and I and I do think the pub, per se, uh, is confronted with a, with an existential threat uh, from Gen Z uh, because it is it has been very bad at um, positioning itself as what I described, rather than just as a place where you go and get drunk or a place you go and maybe not get drunk but drink, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think actually what I'm talking about that kind of sense of freedom, sense of uh, an alternative space, um, third space, whatever you want to call it, where you can relax and meet people and hang out and have fun, uh, is different from a coffee shop uh, and does not necessarily rely on on getting drunk. Mm. Uh, and as a, 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 as, as a non, as a, as a relatively recent, I mean, I've been gave up drinking a year ago, uh, uh, I still go to the pub, still love it, still hang out, talk mm-hmm. to people, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, maybe I don't get quite as crazy as I used to, but, you know, uh, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it's, I, I think I think that's the essence of the pub. Um, and, but I do think that there is, I mean, uh, the, the Luke Johnson line, um, uh, you know, that's, that's, that, that's, I think comes from George Orwell and I think it's, um, I think it's the moon. The moon underwater. It's the pub we're talking about, um, which is his perfect pub. As in George Orwell's. Book. George Orwell's. Oh. He wrote a book about, or he wrote a, 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 a he wrote a, an essay about, you know, what makes the perfect pub, and and he 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 in his he invented this this. I think it's called the moon underwater or the moon something to do with water, uh, and and, it, it, and I think eccentricity was 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 the point there. So, what are some of your favorite pub like? Or where did you get? Like, what are some of your favourite pubs that are really eccentric? Because I think a lot of things back to this, um, 
back to listeners and, and creating this brand is um, uh, Alex Smith told me a, a quote, which is really good by Dolly Parton. And he said, the whole of strategy is, is find out who you are, do it on purpose. Mm. Back to the storytelling pieces. I think a lot of people create the wrong story. Mm. And actually, if you can find out who you are, i.e. your e- 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 eccentricities and do it on purpose, you, you really create something unique. Mm. But I think it's just, it's. so what would you say are some of the pubs that are really like, I don't know, I'm probably planning, you're planning my weekend, Charlie, but uh, I'd love to know, yeah, what are some of your, yeah, weird pubs that really stand out to you? Um, well, I mean, I I think it's, it historically has been, you know, a combination of the pub and and, and the landlord of the pub, you know, uh, who, who, I mean, we, we, in our, in our village in Devon, um, there's a pub called the London Inn, uh, and uh, it, it, you know, the landlord Mike. It, he, he's no longer the landlord, but he was, he was incredibly rude, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and when you went in there, particularly if you're if you're a walker and you went in there and you're kind of cagoule and you're with your with your with your leg, you know, what are those things called? Um, not ganoshes, but things you wear around your your feet, your your, your calves to stop them from getting wet. Uh, uh, or dirty, uh, and so on. And, and he would, he would sort of order you out of the pub and tell you to take everything off and come back in looking all. I mean, he, and this is in an area where a lot of people go walking. Uh, uh, but he was sort of famous for being, you know, obnoxious and, mm. and rude. Uh, and, uh, and he was actually a very nice man, but he was a very funny man. Uh, and, uh, but he, and, and it, as a result, he inspired enormous, uh, enormous loyalty among his, uh, his drinkers. Um, and uh, and he was great, uh, and you know, likewise, um, Tom Conran's pub uh, in in Notting Hill, um, the Cow, beats the Cow. I mean, there a few quite. So there's a my mate owns a sushi business, or this old man used to own a sushi business down the road actually, mm-hmm. and used to service um, selling some um, selling fish. So he's been there. I've been there about three or four times, but that is a yeah. Walk in there, it's like wow. Uh, I mean that's so. Tom is just he's he's a genius at kind of creating a unique atmosphere. I mean that's his I mean, his dad is Terence Conrad, and he's kind of you know in a completely different way. He's kind of worked out how to do stuff, and he's had a number of intriguing businesses around around the neighbourhood. Um, he had a he had a tequila bar called Crazy Homies, and, uh, sadly no longer there, and various other ones. He had a deli called Tom's, but. But the cow remains uh, one, 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 one of the great pumps, and I love that motto, which is um, which is uh, eat, eat heartily and give the house a good name. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, and it's it, he's always had, uh, it's always been run. You know, Tom's the sort of inspiration designer, he, and he's very involved. But but the op, the operation of the pub has always been by these. Crazy uh, Albanian guys. And, so this is and, this is yeah. Max's dad knows, uh, but his name escaped me. But we literally sat at the bar because they do the Luti, uh, Bardi. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to text him after this. They're all great. They're all great guys. But the chicken uh, Kiev is like that's wondrous. Chicken yeah. Kiev is it's incredible. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, the food's really good, but it's also it's also just it, it, it's ended up becoming to my age, uh, fifty six, and, and you know those of my friends who have got divorced. And are back on the market, right? They hang around on the cow. <laughs> so the CDL man, you know. That's pretty well when my dad hangs out there. <laughs> Pro- probably. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, uh, and there's also, you know, a certain kind of divorced woman who goes there or a single woman. And it's quite nice. It's like a kind of dating pub, I think, in a weird way. Uh, although it doesn't, you know. Not tending to be that, and the, the, I, I think the, the regulars would probably kill me for saying that. But but there is definitely a lot of that going on, and there's always extraordinary people kind of coming and going out of that place. So, um, you know, I love the cow uh, definitely. Um, and uh, there used to be, I mean, there was a, the, the the pub that lives long in the memory that went a long time ago. But there was uh, there was one called the Portobello Star on Portobello Road mm. that was featured in. Um, but the Martin Amos book, uh, London Fields, uh, as his kind of definitive part. But it was, it, I mean, I used to drink in there in the 80s and 90s. And uh, there was always kind of, there's a sort of like a cast of characters, you know, uh, they're sort of like an old 
Sergeant Major, who, who is there in his uniform with his medals, you know, mm. uh, who's about a hundred. You know, uh, there was sort of drunk journalists at the bar. There were, there were, and it, it was just, it was tiny part, it packed all the time, kind of people running their market stalls and, you know, going in there for a pint. And it was, it was, but it was just a real, you know, market street neighborhood pub. Uh, the only food they had was cheese toasties. Uh, they had, it was very, the whole thing was tiny and very simple. Uh, and it was just, it lined no floor, uh, had a really good jukebox. Um, and it was just, I mean, jukebox is not really a thing anymore, but, but, uh, it was, it, it was jukebox then was quite important. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, getting your song on, you know, uh, and uh, putting 10 P in or whatever. Uh, hard to believe it. No one even really uses cash anymore, but, but anyway, that, that was another pub that, 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 that tragically went. Um, and is now, I think, turning into, I'm not sure what they're doing with it. Uh, maybe, maybe it will become a, up again, but but uh, for a long time it was a cocktail bar. Um, but yeah, it's almost like back to the, it's almost. I always th- sometimes think going into a great boozer is like it is like a story. Back to the story thing is like you walk in. So there's a place in um, not too far from North Co Road, actually on St John's Hill, yeah. called Churchill's. Yeah. I- Irish pub, like literally tiny, yeah. and it's. Like it's like three pound a pint. Like it's not. It hasn't been. Yes. It's, it's almost one of the darling examples that hasn't been gastrified, if you want to call it that. But you go yeah. there and it's just full of characters, and it's just yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, where I want to go to now is I I right. try and push myself to ask like kind of hard questions. So I think people listening to this have they li- they're listening to almost get some sort of like well, look, Charlie's been there and done that, and he's gone through some hard times. So. On on all your journey, all your businesses, like what's been the, the the darkest day where you probably thought like well, I can't be asked to go on anymore? Like not not with with the business. I mean, because I think I've had it with a podcast. I've you know I've sort of sat there thinking in the early days, I was like, what is the point in this? This is just so fucking difficult. What's mm. been it for you? Or, or, or maybe you've almost like I think I think we uh, well when we got to four sites and we thought. We we had a very successful fourth opening in Charlotte Street in um, in the West End, and it's you know made money from day one that pub, and it was great. Uh, and and then we we got offered this site in in Lord Chablis in, in East Dulwich, uh, yeah. which which I felt should have been and should have been nailed on, um, and uh, we just. I think we we're just quite lazy about the way we did it, and we didn't really under- we didn't really understand the local neighbourhood. We didn't do enough research on on how much you know on pricing, you know, competitive pricing. Um, we didn't uh, we didn't do a very good job doing it up. Uh, we just was we just sort of thought well, the brand was you know we'd had nothing but success up until that point really. We just thought well the brand will just speak for itself and it'll be easy, huh. uh, and and it wasn't. And it, it and we just we had a bad start. We got a reputation of being expensive. We never really found the right manager to run the pub. And it became, meanwhile, we were opening other pubs, but it became such a drain on business. So depressing. No one wanted to go there. Like, you know, I mean, obviously we had to go there, you know, because we were managing it, right? And it was our business, but it was losing money. Uh, and, you know, it was like when we were doing what we call calls, so calls are you know, going around lunchtime or the evening or whenever. And, visiting a certain number of pubs and, 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 you know, monitoring, you know, effectively, uh, and never wanted to go to Lordship Lane. Of course you did. And then you went there and there was just, everything was wrong. You know, it's just awful. Mm-hmm. And it was just because it, because everyone, nobody wanted to go there and because it was, nobody wanted to work there because it was, you know, obviously people aren't stupid. They realized it was, a, it was regarded in the company as being a total dog. Um, and, it's that it was the first site I ever did because I'd had a number of previous businesses as well pre pre draft house. It was the first one I ever did where we just couldn't turn it around, couldn't make it work. Uh, what? Well, why? And, why versus? Why was it so? Because I think Dulwich is a yeah remote well, area. East, like East Dulwich, um, it basically the whole market for 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 sort of drinking had drifted down to Peckham, uh, which is the next the next neighbourhood along. And we'd done a crappy job anyway. It was it was it was not the right shape of site. I mean, there were lots of things wrong with it. I, I don't I don't want to go into the 
yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 detail of it. Uh, but uh, it, it, we tried, and we kept putting more money into it. We kept changing the manager, and we kept doing, you know, all this stuff. Uh, and we just couldn't. We could not get the sales to any kind of reasonable level uh, where we could make money. Uh, and in the end, we had to close it. But we probably because it was the first one that uh, that we'd ever that we'd ever closed that I'd ever been involved in. That, mm. that we that we had to close. It was a huge decision, and it was very depressing, uh, you know, having to do that and just basically throw away a load of money, a load of time, uh, a load of effort. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that I think. And then after that, you know, from time to time, you have sites which don't work, and you're 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 hardened to it at that point. Mm. And you you know you, I think you're much more brutal. I mean, I remember. Um, Crispin Tweddle, the guy from Piper Private Equity, um, famous. I'm, I'm not going to say the name of the uh, the name of the brand, but he they invested in a restaurant brand, um, very very successful, and they were rolling it out. And the next site that they did after 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 Piper's investment was was a a change in the model. It wasn't a high footfall location; it was a residential location, and uh, the early numbers when they opened it weren't good. And I think it was like a month in. They had a board meeting. And, uh, you know, the fact that when they got to the topic of this particular site, you know, on the, and he said, I think, we're, I think we should close it. And everyone's like, what do you mean we should close it? It's only been open for a month. He goes, this isn't going to work. Yeah, it's in the wrong location. If it's not working now. It's not going to work. Anyway, two years later, they closed it, you know, having tried everything. You know, again, their first site, mm. founder's first site that he closed. And I think having the, yeah, again, it's the pendulum, but having, having the, uh, having the courage to say something's not working and, and just dealing, taking it out back and shooting it know. Is, is actually quite important. Um, uh, and there's a point at which I think you have to acknowledge that you're beat, uh, and, uh, it, and, and just move on because those, those are, it's a bit like, you know, people say don't hire people that are, you know, somebody starts to become an energy sapper, you know, rather than energy, rather than bringing energy, you know, uh, get rid of them. Uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and if a pub is sapping the energy of the business because everyone doesn't know it wants to go there, and, yeah, uh, then I think it, you know, at that point, yeah, you, you've got, you've got, you've got to put it out of its misery quickly. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's probably, I mean, uh, believe me, there are many, many more uh, low moments, also lots of high moments. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that is that is the the journey of the of the founders. You you have to be kind of uh, accept the bipolarness of the of the journey in in that in that it is a bit roller coastery. I think. I mean, I I I, I was saying this to someone the other day. I uh, I think to my daughter actually. I was saying I think there is an element of the successful founder um, that is psychotic in the sense that you know the the, the definition of a, of a psychopath. Is someone who who actually has no real empathy or or, or no real, uh, yeah, no real empathy. Uh, what I mean by that is is, and and and, and I said an element of. I don't mean entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you need as a founder, particularly with people, uh, projects, you know, whatever. You you at a given point, you need to just be able to go right. That person's going. That person's coming in. This site's being closed. Uh, this is what we're doing. We're changing. We're changing plan. All that work we've put in, everything that's all being ditched, and we're moving. You know, we're moving forward, and we're moving forward without, you know, X, Y, and Z people. And 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 then it's like at, when that decision's been made, there's no regret. There's no like, oh god, I feel so sorry for poor old Jimmy. You know, such a nice chat. It's just like they're dead to me. How would you say you're psychotic then? And, and uh, as I say, well, and that, and, uh, you know, I think I, th- I th- it's probably. It's I don't an exaggerated term, but what I mean by that is, I mean, definitely with me, if, if I had made the decision that somebody was not going to be working with us anymore, you know, we'd come to, to hopefully a rational decision that I, that be, I wouldn't regress it at all. And I would be very happy to sit down with them. I wouldn't, I, I, I was absolutely fine with sitting down and having that difficult conversation. That really? didn't me at all by the end. Because, you know, it's, it's a bit like, um, that great scene in, uh, Jerry Maguire, when at the beginning, when you know that film, Jerry Maguire. 
Yeah, well, it's worth watching. Uh, there's a wonderful scene when, when Jerry Maguire plays a sports agent working for um, a big sports agency in, uh, in LA and, and, and he, his boss takes him out for a coffee and starts talking to me. And he goes, hang on a second, you're firing me here. You're fucking firing me. And, he's, and the boss goes, don't you start. This is hurting me way more than it's hurting you. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and because, uh, you know, I mean, that's ridiculous. But, 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 but I mean, it is that thing of, I think, being honest with people. And, and, and if, if it's not working, it's not good for them either. So that's so that's what Charlie Big Bigham said. I interviewed yeah. Charlie, and he said that when I didn't know you done Charlie. I'll listen to Charlie. Yeah, Charlie's a good friend of mine. Yeah, uh, really. Yes, that was. In fact, I'd love to um, do one again with him actually. Because I was he's, one of He's a first. very very smart cookie. Yeah, really very, smart. But I, that was right. that was really one of my first yeah. first big ones I did two years ago, and I didn't read. My, um, your, when you listen back, I'm like that was a pile of shit. So I'd love to redo it again. But one of the things he said is he fired this guy, and it was quite difficult. But then the guy called him. I back up like three years later and was like, thank God you fired me. Because you, usually, and he was like- I think I know the guy you're talking about, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, and he was like, it was the best thing you've done for me. And I think for, for people listening to this who are founders or in senior positions and you having to let people go, realise you're, you're doing them a favour as well as doing you. It's a, it's a, it's yeah, a and if, it's got, if, if it's got to the point where you want to sit down with someone and fire them, then it has some, it, it's, you're, no one's in a good place at that point. And, oh god, and, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, and I mean, I think, I think what one of the things you learn, though, conversely to that, is is you learn that because uh, you know when you've got a small business and you're trying to grow it, you haven't got any time for people who are who are complete. As I said earlier, they were completely right in their role. Yeah, uh, and um, I do think that that changes over time, and I think that you know, it, you know, not always, but 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 you can manage people mm. imagine that uh you can rather than just firing them because they're not actually perfect you know you can manage them and teach them mm. train them mm. you know, make them better it's just that when you're very small you don't have that you know the luxury to do that you you can't have anyone as a pastor because you haven't got time to, to, to yeah to, to to pick somebody up off the floor every five minutes you know uh and i think i think but i think you know that's one of the things richard peach from the, the ops guy I was talking about from draft house he was very good at you know, saying, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. First of all, we don't have that many people. We need more people. So let's not just fire people because because they made a mistake. You know, uh, and uh, which is which is completely right. And particularly when the company gets bigger and there's more room, for people. I mean, obviously, you want everyone to be perfect, but there's also an opportunity for people to grow. And you're not ultimately everyone's not going to be perfect. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, sad reality, but probably true. Um, so you need to work out how to manage those people who 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 are not are not perfect, you know. Mm. Um, and there's always a few. They end up being in the, what's now called the C-suite, you know. There's always a few who are perfect, uh, you know. And you're, the most imperfect is normally the founder, anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Psychotic idiot, you know. He's well, this is throwing his toys out of the pram the whole time, you know. Well, this is because I've definitely got. So I, I one kind of. Going down psychotic street a little bit further. That's where I would be, Charlie. <laughs> yes. um, but, Absolutely, my but, happy place. <laughs> but I listened that in the podcast. You you talked with with Mark. You talked about you know put put a, put a rack of ribs in front of you, you'll decimate the whole thing. Bottle of wine. You'll have three. And I've got. I think where I'm psychotic is I've got a uh, an addictive personality or like a compulsive personality. So like if I like something, I'm full hog. There's no like. Halfway houses, you know, I can't just have one pint, I have to have 10, you know, and I'm, I think it's great for work because, I mean, it means I can work like loads and I love doing it and it's just, I, I actually get energy from doing it, mm. but then it can also, I think there's also like bad parts of that. So I'd love to know, like you've stopped boozing now, I think in, in that interview in 2018, you were talking about doing um, cognitive behavioral therapy oh my god was I, yeah. yeah yeah so like how how have you in the like in the little part of you that's psychotic like how how's that unraveled or changed in the last couple of years yeah i mean what 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 i mean what i mean by psychotic is 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 a uh, is ultimately being able to switch off the empathy gene if 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 it's not required you know in in uh it yeah so so essentially if yeah, so there are some people who find it very, very hard, and it, that may not be suited to being entrepreneurs. They find it very hard to say goodbye to people, and therefore they keep people around who, 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 and then the business just stagnates as a result. That's what I meant by that. I mean, it is related, but 
I think I think um, you know the stress levels of running your own business are immense, and a lot of a lot of um, founders do self medicate in different ways. Uh, you know whether it's you know excessive running of marathons or or you know the ten pints or the or, or or may have both, <laughs> or both. You know, yeah, it's probably not that healthy either. Uh, uh, and um, so I think I think that is um, that is for sure uh, a thing, and it's something that I think you need as a founder. And I'm Luke is quite good on this, Luke Johnson. But I think you do need to um, keep an eye on your mental health and be healthy physically and, and mentally healthy, because otherwise, you know you. You, you could start to become a liability, you know, either because you're not healthy or because because you're just making bad decisions or whatever. Because you know you're hungover, it. I'm not you, but because one is hungover and uh, maybe a bit gloomy and cross because you're hungover, but you don't realise that. Take it out, so what? Do what? And 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 actually, you know, as a leader of the business, particularly a small business, you don't get a day off. Yeah, you, know, you don't get an off day. Uh, you've got it. You've got to be there all the time. You've got to be consistent. Go so, so I think I think, uh, and there are lots of you know, tons of examples of founders who who are complete animals, you know, in the part or whatever. But but I think ultimately, as business grows, you you, know, you you've got to stabilize uh, and, and and be consistent. And speaking personally, um, it you know, I mean, I, I what, before we went on, I told you the uh, the. the the, the the Dean Martin uh, theory of martinis, uh, which is that um, drinking one martini is perfect, uh, drinking two martinis is too many, and drinking three martinis is not enough. Uh, I think I think I think a lot of people uh, who drink can can identify with that, uh, and that was definitely one of my issues, as I didn't really know where to stop. I was not an alcoholic, I don't think, in the classic sense of the of, of, of the term, but I definitely was a binger. Uh, and, uh, I found in my fifties, uh, which are a long way off down, but I found that it was just, my mood was, was not right all the time. I was getting really cross or really gloomy about stuff, uh, and finding it. And it was obviously, you know, not great for your health either, but I was, I was finding myself like not really, uh, being proactive either. And uh, I just thought the hell that I was going to, I'm just going to give up. So how much were you drinking? Because again, I'm sort of say I'm asking for a mate, but asking for myself. Because ah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably I will just been I I can pretty much drink Wednesday to Sunday. I was like not in terms of like getting absolutely leathered all of those days. Yeah, but like if I'm going for dinner on a Wednesday, I'll have a drink. Thursday, a couple of drinks. Friday, probably more drinks. Saturday, more drinks. Sunday, so it almost slopes like that. Some weeks, and then some weeks I just won't drink. But actually, yeah. Torres, it's most I, weeks. So how, how often were you drinking? Because in, I think, in my in my 20s and 30s, I almost never didn't drink. So and how, I, I've drank seven days a week. Okay. Uh, how much, though? Uh, quite a lot. But, I mean, no, not a lot, every, but, I mean, I, I was definitely topping up, you know, uh, because, of, you know, I mean, I remember in Scotland when I was at university, we all, we, the, 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 those of us who were the drinkers used to go to the hotels on Sunday because the pubs were closed in those days uh, and the hotels was so booze, you know, because we couldn't really do a day without drinking. Uh, so definitely was a regular drinker. But then by the time I got to 40, 50, I was, I was taking days off. But when I was drinking, I mean, easily do, I was more of a, uh, well, definitely a beer drinker, but uh, wine was the really challenging thing for me. So I would, I would, I would drink, you know, easily drink two to three bottles of wine at night. Mm. Whiskey, I was also had a slight issue with, so I could do probably the better part of a bottle of whiskey, uh, and I mean, not not every night at all, but you know, if I was on one, Thai water, yeah, you know, yeah, you didn't you? Uh, and I mean, it, you know, it wasn't anything. I wasn't like a colossal alcoholic or a colossal binger, but I definitely had it in me to do that from time to time, and it was quite rare that I went a week or even a day without some kind of drink. But towards the end, I started like taking more and more time off. So in my fifties, I was like doing Lent or doing Dry January or whatever, and taking a month off. And and then I was when I was starting drinking again, I was thinking, actually, I don't know if I really want to do this. And then it, you get back on the chain gang, and it's like, okay, well, I'm drinking now, so I'm drinking, you know, uh, yeah. and and not really enjoying it, uh, and just feeling like it was just making everything a bit messy. Uh, so just my health, there were a couple of things uh, and I just decided, you know, in last May, 
Uh, so 13 months ago, I just decided to to knock it on the head. And mostly been okay. I mean, I think there's a, there's a few situations where, you know, you miss like, you know, a boozy lunch, which obviously you're not boozy, but you go along because, you know, friends, colleagues, whatever. Uh, and, you know, there's that, thing, there's that thing where you're like, well, I just like to drink, you know, two bottles of wine and have a great lunch uh, and then go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Drink a few pints, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think I, I, I said this to someone else the other day, I think that for me it was just, I just like drinking the, the actual, it wasn't like, to make me have a good time or to, you know, make me feel better. I actually just liked physical process of drinking and how it made me feel. Uh, but also, you know, you don't get high without getting low. And yeah. uh, that, that was the, that was the issue. I think there's one thing I, I think, and it's, it's all one of the things I like to do with this podcast is find a nuance, right? Because obviously now culturally there's this, if you want to be a founder or a successful founder and you can't drink, um, no, uh, but, uh, this one, what I'm trying to get at is, is, is but, there is this kind of pernicious thing of like, you know, go and meditate, go and do ice baths, go yeah, and do, do you know what I mean? And I'm just like, I'm, uh, what makes me worried is that- I think anyone can be a founder, you know, it's, it requires, um, it, re- it requires an element of being a bit, you know, I mean, uh, different from being psychotic, i.e. the empathy, but you do need to be a bit nuts, you know, because it's a, it's an absolutely terrible job, right? It's an awful job, you know, I mean, why, who would do it? Why can't you just work for someone else and turn up at nine in the morning and leave at six, you know, and then have a nice time, you know, rather than just sitting there at one in the morning, you know, just stressing out about something, trying to trying to finish something or whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a shit job. So you need to you need to really, you know, want to do it. Mm. Uh, and in the, that's where the Messiah thing comes in. It's like you know, I've got, I need you know, I'm chosen to do this, you know. And, uh, and, and I'm the only person who can do this. And all these other people are relying on me, you know, uh, and that's where it can help you. So I think it's believing that, you know, you are actually responsible for other people, for the business brand, for, uh, and, uh, but ultimately you need to, you need to disengage from that and, and, um, and systematize the whole thing. But, you know, look, I, 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 I don't think, I think it, just like, you know, normal people, uh, who don't who don't found businesses? Uh, some of them can drink and some of them can't. Mm, yeah, mm. it's the same. It's not, it's not yeah, no, no, I mean, it's not any different. And I think you know, ice baths great. You know, whatever. But, but you can also have a, a drink as well. Like, I love all that now, and I yeah. spend a lot of time. You, you know, I I mean, to your point about being an addi- an addictive personality. I mean, I now focus a lot my health. You know, whatever, and that's just my addiction is like trying to get healthy. Wow. Um, and uh, you know. I think it is a slightly happier addiction for me personally, but but it's definitely not notwithstanding, it's definitely a compulsion. Uh, so um, yeah, and that's it's uh, as as Perry puts it, and you know I've interviewed Julian Metcalf. Um, there's almost like this relentless pursuit of relentless pursuit of better, relentless pursuit of like food. Or there, but there's this common theme, and it's not. I don't want to you know sit here and speculate and generalize, but like. One of the themes I've picked up from some of the flowers I've interviewed is this kind of this relentless, which is ties into your kind of nuts piece mm. pursuit of something, and whether you turn that into to take a right and go down health health eye spots or take a left and go down the boozer, but but it is I, I think it's not binary, and you can do a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 No, I think I think I think you're right. I think I think that's that is what you described with Julian, uh, who's very you know, inspiring, but also uncompromising, you know, person, for example, Julian Metcalf, uh, Perry is completely uncompromising about quality and he'll only do things that he wants to do that are amazing, you know? And, uh, I think, I, I, I think, you know, ultimately a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you that they, that they were, they were unemployable by anyone else, you know, and it certainly wouldn't be able to find a job that would, that would give them that. The uh, the founder of Minor Fig, do you know Minor Figures? The, yeah, the, I do. So Stuart, the, the, the oak milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like he's like Australian. He's like he's like mate, mate. You've got to like bite off more than you can chew, and then chew like hell. That was the thing. And he said, "There's he's, he goes, I'm the kind of founder who will drag it over gloves. Like yeah. you've got, but yeah, I think it's 
it's, yeah, no, he's, he's absolutely right. And 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 the whole fake it till you make a thing and everything. I mean, that's all a, a key part of it. And it, again, you know, that's another that's another pendulum slash dial thing where faking it till you make it is really important. I mean, you've got to go sit in front of somebody and go, "We've done X, Y, and Z." You might have done some of it, or you might have kind of almost got some of it, or in your head you've kind of done it already, even though you haven't. You know, because otherwise you're never going to have any chance of you know getting whatever you're trying to get off that oh, guy. Yeah. Uh, and um, and then and then there's the crook, the fraud, you know, who gets sucked too far down that side and, and suddenly they're they're not behaving properly. Mm. They're gonna go to jail. And that happens, you know, and that's another and and you know, balancing between those two sides of the pendulum is also uh, but I don't think you can do I think there's very few businesses uh, which can which where people don't blag a bit at some mm. point. You know, I think blagging. Oh, it's quite. Yeah, I think I see that with just but, people but, on. I mean, as a as a director, of course, uh, a non exec director, of course, your job in part is to spot the blag and kind of sit on it. You know, uh, because you know you can if, if you've been doing it for a long time, <laughs> you can tell once the founder starts banging on about something, you <laughs> just know that. It's just bollocks, you know. Uh, that was normal. <laughs> there's, um, yeah, I, I completely agree. There's a few, a few more, couple of things, more things I want to explore with you, Charlie. If that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So, so one is, yeah, is is AI. So, what was I'm, inter- I'm interested to hear that I predicted the the dawn of AI yeah, five like, years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now, as I said. Mm-hmm. I, I, the Messiah could be replaced by profit. Yeah. <laughs> this guy was, uh, as I said, as I said. Oh, I know what it was. Yeah, I know. I do. I know. I think I know what you're talking about. Burger King listening to us. Oh my God, that's five years ago. Like, and it's gone so quick. Hmm. It's very much here. A- AI. And I'm saying that in quite a, like a dystopian way of saying things, but it's, it's here. Some people are like doubling down it perry loves it i mean he's he's got his own little robot called um well not robot is it well he was sending daddy this guy Don't think he made that up it's called oscar or something um but specifically like going into butchies going into bruiser going into food stuff going into uh breakfast club like how do you think ai is gonna actually impact restaurants we've talked a lot about it in other ways but it's specifically well, I'm, in- I'm gonna preface my remarks by saying that i i I was reading something and it came up on my feed, which I try not to do in, in, in on my phone. Uh, uh, I'm a Bob Dylan fan, for better or for worse. Uh, and uh, they, 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 someone had asked ChatGPT to write a song about, you know, something or other in the style of Bob Dylan, and it was just garbage. Uh, so at least Bob, I think, for the moment is safe. You know, he, he's, he's, he's not going anywhere. He, he, he could definitely write better than ChatGPT. Uh, I, think, I think probably what I was saying was Mark, McCormack, McCormack. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. McCormack, I think God, he would kill me because I'm actually quite a good friend of his. I'm a very big fan of his. Uh, but anyway, um, memory for names clearly in decline. Um, uh, I think probably what I was saying to him, and and what I believe, um, 100 more so now than ever, is that um, it's it's pretty clear to me post COVID, pre COVID also, but post COVID even more so that most people. There are fewer and fewer people who want to, for example, work in a kitchen. I mean, there's a start. You know, windowless room, uh, fairly abusive environment, hot. Uh, it's, it's quite unpleasant, really, in a kitchen. Uh, and you have to be a bit weird um, to want to work in a kitchen. And I think there's just fewer and fewer people who really want to do that. That's borne out by all the stats around, you know, trying to recruit people to work in kitchens gets harder and harder and harder. Uh, obviously, we, we uh, you know, as a nation, um, you know, we, we were... Uh, to certain extent, you know, benefiting slash taking advantage of, uh, you know, less less well off people coming in from, for example, Eastern Europe and now India, uh, as as we've seen from the statistics, and also from walking into restaurants and hotels, uh, and uh, you know, those guys uh, will do it because you know they don't necessarily have a choice. I mean, that's the job that's available, so they'll do it. Mm. Uh, but it's probably not their ambition to stay in the kitchen forever. They probably would like to go and do something else. Uh, and eventually, I, I think we'll, we'll, I think we have arrived actually already at the point where it's really hard to find people who actually want to do that job. Um, so I think that 
automation, AI, robotics, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going to be a critical part of, of the future of hospitality. It should allow, ultimately should allow for pricing to come down. Um, because one of the big, you know, when you look at the, the P and L model of a restaurant, you know, if you, if you, if you take a hundred pounds, you're going to spend roughly 25 to 30 of those pounds on buying products. And you're going to spend another, if it's a restaurant, typically around another 30 pounds on staff, right? And then you left those staff are not, yeah. And then there's rent, uh, operating expenses, et cetera. Uh, and those, those, those staff are not necessarily, particularly the back of house team, not necessarily that happy. They don't really want to be there. And yeah, they're taking probably 15 to 20% of your total sales. Uh, so if there's a way to automate the process, I think everybody would be happier, uh, and made more money, you know? Uh, and so I, I think, I think that's absolutely critical, uh, is, 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 and that is definitely future. And the other key, key element of AI slash robotics slash, you know, drones slash what can we learn from the Ukraine war, uh, is delivery. So delivery, uh, i.e., you know, the delivery of hot food to people at home, like, just eat or Deliveroo, yeah, uh, or food stuff uh, is is a really challenging business because and no one has really worked out how to make money out of it. I mean, it, food stuff actually does interestingly. Its model is quite profitable, um, and when it gets to scale, I think it will be a very profitable business. Um, but the big guys who are trying to be the equivalent of Amazon, you know, the everything store, namely mm, mm. Just Eat, Deliver it, Deliveroo, and uh, are um, you know they need they they need drones they need ro- robots they need because it's just too expensive the customer won't pay the amount of money that is required for them to be profitable you know uh, they just won't uh, and it, it, I mean I think they've tried uh, yeah. and it, and they end up discounting you know we all get we're swamped by discounts from Justy and Deliveroo all the time trying to tempt us into ordering tempt us to join their fucking club or whatever it is, you know, uh, and, but they're still losing money and it, it may delivery may be one of those businesses like the railways in America where, you know, it's the second or third generation of owners who actually make money because during the, during the journey of that sector, uh, the first generation of owners, it may be impossible for them to make money and they may just run out of money and go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And then another generation may come in, uh, new owners buy them out of bankruptcy because they've got strong brands. I mean, Just Eat Delivery, very strong brands, mm. great operating system, just not profitable. Uh, maybe they'll come up with some other scheme and maybe they'll be the ones or maybe it'll be the ones after them, which is what happened in railways in America, which is the third generation of owners who the first one spent the CapEx, the second one tried to perfect the model but couldn't, and the third one just bought the whole thing for a pound uh, and made a fortune, right? Uh, after all the CapEx had been written off. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I think I think that is uh, both of those two areas, kitchens and uh, and delivery. We we urgently need AI, and and I mean, I'm hoping that one of the out of that absolute clusterfuck over in Ukraine, I'm I'm really hoping that you know the drone thing, which you know they're really really evolving the drone very fast. Well, so you think you'll be fine for the end, shit like that? Well, I mean, it's been. It, Yes, I do. Yeah, that's mad, yeah. But I and I and I, I mean, that's I, I'm not I'm not the only one who's saying that. I mean, that it's, be, it's being trialed, uh, and why not? Yeah. And in Milton Keynes, I when we had a pub up there, they had these little little robots going along, you know, just they were, they were trialing on the pavement, mm-hmm. like these little wheeled robots that were supposed to be delivering stuff. Uh, yeah, it's happening, uh, but it's happening slowly, and it's probably you know ten years off. You know what's mad though is like even. You know, five years will go like that, and I, that's what was so mad about that podcast. Is we, we were talking then about obviously um, street food so ubiquitous now, but it's like when the, in the eight, 2018, I think it's been a lot longer than that, but it wasn't as prolific. And it's like these ideas as you know start very nascent early adopters, and then they eventually do before you know. You, it's a retrospective. You're like, oh my god, that happened so quickly. But when you're looking this way round, it's different. One thing I want, I've been yeah meaning to ask you is. You, you you know like the the P and L of the uh, hospitality business. 
super like better than anyone, right? And and uh, what do what I don't understand is how a business like Carly shows Jamie's Byron goes like that. I don't understand how a business that big goes bust. Like, what would you if you were to? I think what happened looking uh, to, I, I think, think what happened to a lot of the casual dining brands and it's still happening um, is they uh, they started off. I mean, Jamie's in particular, for example, um, as I understand it, started off with a very, very high break-even point. So they they took very big sites, huge rents. They took like whatever the best site in the town was. That's the one they took with a massive rent at a time when everyone was chasing sites, so rents were going crazy anyway. So their profit cost was really, really high, and they needed. I think in, in the case of Jamie's, I think the break-even was sort of fit, you know, forty-five, fifty k. My understanding a week, uh, and. Meanwhile, um, you know, to, we've we've covered some of this uh, already, but they they um, you know they created brands, and obviously in the case of Jamie's um, and Coluccio's, there was a, there were sort of TV driven brands. Yeah, most of them were yeah. were on TV. Jamie much more so, uh, and um, but they never really worked out how to consistently deliver great product, great customer service. Uh, and as a result, and because of the, the the high cost base, they were always, you know, a little bit expensive, maybe for what they were. You could argue that point. Um, uh, but as a result, you know, they were vulnerable to people um, moving on to the next thing. Um, and, you know, their sales dropped over time. Uh, then it's the, you know, we talked about catching the falling knife. You know, it's like, what costs can we cut? You know, because... Our break-even point's too high, so let's start putting less stuff on. Let's let's start buying boil in the bag pasta. Let's start, you know, doing whatever it is. Uh, pre-made sauces, you know, let's not make everything from fresh anymore. Uh, and you know that starts, you know, I mean, if you do it deliberately and it's and you and, you, and you've you've understood that that's not going to impact on the customer, uh, that can work. I mean, you know, cutting costs per se is not a bad thing, mm. uh, but. When when you're when you start from such an idealistic um, perspective or uh, position on you know making your own yeah you know, let's just say making your own sources you really set your stall out on that and then it becomes apparent to customers and almost more importantly to the staff who joined in the first place because you know they wanted to be a part of this amazing business that was doing everything properly you know yeah. uh, and then you know that that starts to go. So it's the story. Uh, because because they're not yeah it's 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 not telling the truth you know yeah uh, and then and then the good people start to leave um, and you know the sales are going down uh, and then there comes a point and and kind of at some at some level you can make more money but then it comes a point where the sales are dropping too much uh, and then you start to lose money and at that point it's like then it's like free fall uh, and then you know maybe you get a few bad stories in the press. Something you know, yeah. someone rumbles you for, for for not doing what you say you're doing, uh, and the whole thing starts to starts to go horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, I mean, I'm not suggesting that's all of those things happen to Jamie's and or Carluccio's, but um, but it, some elements of those things would have happened for that to happen. And and so it's what I said earlier: is you've got to continuously invest and improve, not not get worse. If you saw if a brand is in decline from a from a customer rating point of view, from a product quality point of view, or whatever, versus its brand promise and it's getting worse, then there's a given point at which that becomes unmanageable. Mm-hmm. And the the set the sales will just drop right off. Uh, at which point you have no choice but to go bust. Um And what so to two final things, because I mean if this is just flying past, but the um you talked about putting systems in place and I think systems, there's a quote I love for, for someone who's got such a scatty brain, I have to, I should probably get it tattooed on my fucking forehead, Guys, but it's as slow is smooth, smooth is fast and slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And it's basically kind of, if you slow down and put systems in, you speed up, right? Oh. So case in point with this, obviously it's not a restaurant, but the, the process of creating the, the conversations or the editing um, um, was a shit show to deal with. Now more systems have gone in. It takes me much, I can polish one of these out much quicker, right? Mm. 
because there's a system in place. So that, and it's been really, really, really helpful. Probably the, I've cut the tight time down per episode by maybe four or five hours. Wow. Um, yeah, through, through hiring a guy who helps me with the systems. But what are some of the systems you guys put in place with Rich Impeachment that allowed you to, to, yeah, build, build out the draft house? I think I think I mean, there were loads, but I think I think the most important thing was setting out clear expectations and with with metrics attached to what was what could look like and what 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 we expected from management from the team and so on. Because as you get bigger, it's no longer like he's a good guy. He, he you know we'll put him in place and we'll just do it. You know, it's like unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know. Every, every 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 step of every moment of the day will have you know stuff that needs to get done like opening procedures setting up service you know starting first customer walks you know all the way through and it's just it's it's all those routes are closing down at night cleaning up you know uh, and you know and that weekly basis you you'll have stock taking you know to, to make sure stuff isn't getting nicked and to make sure that you know, we're, we're not over portioning or under portioning, mm. you know, uh, and you'll have a mystery diner, you'll have, and, and, and gradually over time. And it's, it's, it is, it, it can seem to be death by a thousand cuts and it can seem to be just disheartening after a while where you just get layers and layers and layers of systems coming in. But ultimately, I don't really think you can grow, you know, without those things. And, 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 Simplifying whatever you can that's not going to affect um, customer is obviously critically important because in the end, you know, when you first start, you you build complexity into a lot of things without realizing it, and then some of those things could, you know, to your point, you can say four or five hours on the podcast, and some of those things will will will, and, and and you know, one of the crazy things in the restaurant business is that each element of control and measurement has got its own now app or 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 or, or SaaS application, you know. Uh so whether it's start taking, rotor, uh HR, um customer feedback, you know, they're all different companies that are providing that. And then they all come through onto one screen and there's kind of not one, you know, portal or one dashboard where you can look at everything. Uh it's kind of like you've got to download all the information and retype it into, mm. you know, a summary, you know, for the board or for whoever. And I think that there now are some systems that are coming in, which are everything systems, like the restaurants, like it's one, you know, you, you, you got what you, you open up one screen and you can do all of those things. Mm. Uh, not going to get into what they are, but, but I, I think that is, there is, it's crazy that the, 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 the software slash app, uh, side to running restaurants, given that you know you, you can end up paying eight or nine different monthly fees for eight or nine different you know applications to help you to do different things in the business uh, to basically help you to automate more and help you and help and help you to save time and also to monitor and have transparency on how the business is performing. Hmm. Um, but these things are all. Um, they're all just another couple of grand a month, you know, and and it's quite painful. Um, and so I think that is an area again where, you know, if we put the point about AI tech, etc., hospitality is, is, is super important. Is is how do we how do we make that whole monitoring and and and, and control process flow better? But you're right. I mean, and and in in and, and as each of those systems gets installed, like a new tool, yeah, or whatever. There is definitely a painful phase when that when everyone's adapting to that system, you know. Uh, and occasionally you introduce one, and everyone just goes, "We're not fucking doing this." In a way, you think, well, this is, this, is, this one is too much, you know. We're not doing anything. You're not having to go. Actually, we're not going to do that yet. You know? It goes so back we're to the, that one. Yeah. It goes back to the, the Messiah imposter syndrome complex, whereby you sometimes think, as we need more systems coming into place, slow as slowly, speed as fast. And you put the system in place, and then. You know, I've seen this happen firsthand, and you're like, and the core team are like, well, this is the way we do things around here. I ain't fucking doing that. Like, this is just too much time to learn how to do that. And then this, there's, a, there's a lot of um, uh, kind of stickiness when implementing systems short term, but long term, there's huge upsides. 
case in point, some of this stuff my editor told me to put into place. And I was like, I ain't fucking doing that, wasting time. Whereas now I'm like, wish you told this thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for final, final bit, Charlie, because there's, there's lots of people listening to this who are, are trying to be the next Butchies, are trying to be the next yeah. Black Bear Burger. Um, I actually, because I'm back, back to my kind of uh, insidious gluttony. I was in, uh, I was in Canary Wharf on last week. Oh, what did you choose? Did you go in and you were like, oh my God, I burnt this. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> I, went, I went for a... Well, One of each. I did. Yeah. I, 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 I did. I did. You know, I went for the Black Bear Burger, and which was unbelievable. And then I got um, uh, like a whole slew of uh, fried chicken. So the mm. wings, tenders, yeah. oh, unreal. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I got both. Um, it, is but, the be- it is genuinely the best fried chicken. I mean, I'm just saying that for the record. It, it is. is very yes. It is. it is the best. Yeah, it's uh, and you, and you, you know, Butchie, I'm, I'm I'm leading very close to like Butchies is the best fried chicken. I tried fried chicken so are available. But <laughs> that of McGinnis. But but so what what do most people get wrong when they as as a food operator? Maybe they they've got one restaurant or they've got they 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 that like Butchies. They're selling at Broadway Market. Like in that early stage, what are the washouts? Like what is going to stop them from 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 growing to um, uh, two to three sides. Obviously, there's a myriad of different options, and it's situational. But I mean, just in, in general, there, there are some there are some businesses, and you look at it when they start, you say, "What are they thinking?" Um, did you see that one that bar that was selling crisps? In, uh, I'm sorry, restaurant that was selling crisps <laughs> with like dips. In. I sorry, so that's, that's hilarious. So I thought I've always thought of a, a subscription model because you know the crisps abroad are so good. Yeah. I love Chris abroad for some reason. I looked at Mr. Shit this idea and thank God I didn't pursue it. But yeah. of a subscription model of Chris, but anyway, yeah. No, there was just, there was just, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think whatever you do, it, it, it's much easier to do something that sits inside one of the mainstream um, categories. I mean, particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm currently obsessing about QSR, i.e. fast food, but, but, you know, it sits within one of those categories like pizza, pasta, noodles, um, you know, chick, fried chicken, burgers, you know. I mean, I think trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to sell people crickets or something is going to be challenging, you know. Um, and ultimately what you're trying to do is, is there some kind of intersection between price, quality, brand, you know. Um, and if you get, for the for whatever your price, I mean, the, the genius of uh, Franco Banker was, uh, I mean, I'm not actually a Neapolitan piece of them, but if you are, most people are, so it's fine. Uh, but the genius of that was, you know, they, they they had a pizza for a long time that I think was five pounds or was just under five pounds. Um, the marinara, you know, just smart sauce yeah. pizza, uh, and it was a super high quality pizza, uh, and uh, it was in a, in, served in a nice environment. And ultimately, when delivery came along, it was very deliverable, uh, and that was, you know, a great business. Mm. Uh, uh, was that Lou Johnson as well, or was that no? That's David Page. Uh, who, Sorry, yeah. who who has a business they just sold actually to the Japanese called Fulham Shaw, which owned that the real Greek and a couple of other things. Uh, and I think you know you look at um, something like Mead Liquor and 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 Scott Collins's business, uh, and you've got an incredible burger. Yeah, you know, you've got outrageous brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got great atmosphere, incredible music. You know, you walk into Mead Liquor and it's you know, it's not like being at anywhere else. Uh, and uh, you know, and it's good price point. Uh, and uh, so I think, I mean, I've got a chart uh, with, which which tries to sort of, you know, at the, at the, at, at, at the, in the middle of success and then coming off and there are lots of spokes with the things I think you really think about. But uh, I, I think ultimately the bottom line is um, that the quality of the, the quality of the product as I say, versus the price point, versus the story and brand around it, those three things. Sorry, it's sorry. So the, the price, 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 quality, of quality. Product. Yeah, you know, like something essentially that's craveable. Yeah, yeah, you know, is what we're talking about. Mm. Like, I need to have a butchies. Mm. You know, I had six pints last night, and it's like a, it's a cheesy rider day. Yeah, nothing I can do about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, a brand. You know, what's the story around that? What's the feel? What's the what's the thing? And then around that is 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 other things that are critically important, like you know, obviously systems, eventually um, team, 
you know, building a great team, rec- learning how to recruit, learning how to train, learning how to retain great people and develop them. Yeah. You know, but those things do, I mean, they're, they're, as you grow, they become more, they become much more important. Um, but that initial thing is, 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 you know, it has to be the best burger. It has to be at the right price, whatever that price is. Mm. Uh, and of course, very challenging at the moment with inflation, knowing what the right price is. Should we be holding on and losing margin points, you know, losing percentage of, or should we be increasing our prices? And just, I mean, and that's a tough one. And yeah, mm. uh, but you know, very few people are getting that one right. I think there's no, there's no right answer to that. Uh, and then, you know, if you're lucky, I mean, that's one of the joys of the whole street food starting point uh, uh, is the kind of brand of atmosphere point is kind of less important. Mm. And, and you can kind of, as we said earlier, you can kind of got the price point, right? And you've got a fantastic product. The brand can be very simple around that. And then as you grow and let's say you then want to open a bricks and mortar restaurant at that point, you can, you know, you can do maybe a light brand exercise around that. And then as you, as you start to grow the business, you just keep investing in that brand piece, uh, and in the other systems around it, team, you know, mm. cost controls, you know, uh, stock, HR, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but, but it, but, but it starts with that. I think that intersection between value or price and, and, and quality. So it's basically, yeah, if you, it, let's say you say, right, because I mean, there's nothing to stop anyone from making the next great pizza brand, right? I mean, pizzas and pizzas business are keeps reinventing itself all the time. Uh, the, the whole world loves pizza. You yeah. mean to Chris? No. Have you heard of Chris? No. Oh my god! You- it's a very powerful brand. I can tell you right away. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh my god! So it's so he in a pub in Fulham, like okay, F- F- Fulham. I used to live in Fulham, um, in a. Uh, football booze it's a football booze it right mm. um, and he started making this pizza it's been voted like some of the best pizza and it's, oh, wow. and it's basically he lived um, he goes to New York tries every different type of pizza it's fucking banging and it's so clever how Neo- everyone was doing Neapolitan pizza this kind of guy's coming and says we're crisp mm. all that is right by the river cafe so all the chefs used to eat there so they got the early adopters yeah yeah and then, and that spread like wildfire, and you cannot get in, but it is categorically the best pizza. But it's like, how does someone like that, re- and, you know, I'm not trying to get, how do they? Get- oh, I think, I, well, I think, I think he's probably solved the, the, the most difficult problem, which is, you know, having a product that everyone's talking about. I mean, except for me, because I've heard of it. You need to go if you're not, what, you know, what, yeah. what do I know? I'll look <laughs> it up after this and go down there. Uh, but, but I, I, I he solved the first critical problem, which is obviously he's got a product that people crave and talk, want to talk about because ultimately craving is talking about, right? It's like, I really want a butchies. Yeah. So yeah. that's your person sitting at the desk next to the desk next door to you, you know, and they're like, what's butchies? There you go. You've got another customer, you know? Uh, and so he solved that problem, but now he's got, you know, he may need, he may need to, to raise a few hundred grand, you know, unless he can make it out of cash. Yeah, it was cash profits. He may need to raise a couple of hundred grand to 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 open a bricks and mortar site. That's what he wants to do. Mm. Uh, and you know, that's when the fun starts, right? Because you've then got all the things we've been talking about today come into play increasingly. You know, site one, site two, site three. You know, it becomes impossible to manage. You need to think through how you're going to evolve the systems to to, to control it. Who you need to run the business operationally. You know, some businesses start with three people. You know, like Caravan, for example. You know, started with those three Kiwis. It's wonderful. It's what I think we have interviewed them. They're great, Laura, yeah. Laura, and Chris. They're Laura, Chris, and Miles. Yeah, they're they're brilliant. Uh, and uh, so you 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 got to hope you've got the right three people, right? Uh, so that they can all add value. But I, I think I think yeah, you know, it's everything we've talked about today. But it starts with Chris. It starts with the pizza that is the different. It's 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 in the format, but it's a different it's a different in story. It's a different angle, yeah. uh, and it's a different yeah. I mean, it does start with a story, but it but it starts the story is this is different and better, right? That's the Crispin Twaddle line from Piper. Is it different? Is it better? Uh, it's and, different, yeah, the product uh, is different. Yeah, better. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it's not too different in my view. I mean, yeah, you know, 
cr- you know, cricket kebabs is quite a big league for some people. You know, and you're probably going to lose ninety percent of your market. Don't want to eat crickets, right? As uh, uh, but or and and also, you know, let's face it, most people can make crisps, uh, can buy crisps and, and and dips and have it at home. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 really, to that. it's really it's really hard to make a good pizza at home i mean supermarket bought pizza is rubbish yeah. you know let's face it uh, chips from home are rubbish you know oven chips ung. uh you know burgers cooked in a frying pan at home no thank you uh i mean it could be okay but it's not great um yeah so things that things that you can't do at home helps Mm. Yeah, it's difficult to make good ramen at home. Uh, it's a long yeah, yeah. That 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 Nate, the Ivan ramen from New York, has yeah. come over. Um, I, who I, I had it when I was in New York, but um, is it good? In I mean, I'm fucking believable. Yeah, I'm a big tonkotsu fan. I have to say. Oh, tonkotsu! Because yeah. I've interviewed Sarah William, who's yeah. the I think one of the investors there. Yeah. Um, but let, let's wrap this up. I mean, we're going to have to do a part two because I didn't even get through half the fucking questions. But um, I have absolutely love that, Charlie. Always happy to come back. Yeah, thank Lo- you. Lo- no one loves the sound of their own voice more than me, except for Perry Head and Taylor, of course. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, happy to come back. Uh, and what fun. Thank you so much.